This video contains every Spanish idea, principle, and fundamental that you need in order to understand how Spanish operates as a language. After watching this video, you will have a clear basis of Spanish and understand how to use its ideas properly. In essence, this video is a long collection of all of my previous videos combined that show and explain each Spanish concept individually so that way you don't have to search each concept on its own. Everything that you need in Spanish is in this video, aside from verbs like gustar and the difference between que and cual. I've decided to not describe them because these are Spanish concepts that do not need thorough explanations. Aside from that, everything else is in this video. Some moments will have weird sentences like this concept is for a future video, but that is because all of my videos are edited into one long video. Some parts will be slower, quieter, and maybe even faster than others, and I do apologize for these moments. Like I said at the beginning, this is a simple collection of all my previous videos combined, so therefore, I cannot go back and change them in any way. What's in this video is the same across all of my previous videos, and I will end the video with a short conclusion explaining why I showed these ideas as they are. Anyhow, enjoy. This is my first official video on my channel that's gonna go in depth with the aspects of a language that you would need to know to speak. I chose to go with Spanish first because I'm learning it right now and I would even say that I have an intermediate to an advanced level of Spanish in all aspects of reading and writing, moderate speaking, and a bit of listening. Though I'm not a native Spanish speaker, I do have a substantial amount of knowledge when it comes down to the fundamentals of the language. And by fundamentals, I mean the first words, phrases, and sentences that you would need to know to start speaking Spanish on a beginner level. Everybody has to start with the fundamentals of the language. Understanding the basic syntax of the language, the alphabet, words, verbs, phrases, and everything in between. The Spanish alphabet is actually no different than the English alphabet following the same letters. But there are a few differences, like having an ñ, which is an N with a squiggle over it. Having 27 letters instead of 26, like in English, and also every letter is pronounced differently. As someone who's learning Spanish, you don't necessarily need to learn how to pronounce every letter of the alphabet. What you do need to learn is how to use these letters in context. However, I will still pronounce them for you so that you can understand how the language is spoken. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, Ñ, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. That's how the language sounds like when spoken. As a side note, people sometimes like to include the letters CHE and YE, making the alphabet have 29 letters. But these are mainly sound letters that are used a lot less. And something important to say about the sound, YE, typically speaking if you're someone who is not of Spanish heritage, you will pronounce the sound as YE. Two L's make a YE sound, like llave, which is Spanish for key. Now, I would like to speak about the words that you would need to know to say daily if you want to speak Spanish. For now, the biggest advice that I can give is to just memorize these words and keep them locked in your mind. And whenever I say memorize this or memorize that, it basically means that I simplified the context to its easiest form. It cannot get any easier than this. So it's not going to be difficult to memorize these words and have them locked in your memory. Here's what I'm going to begin with. Accents, question words, prepositional words and adverbs, pronouns, days of the week, months, seasons, time words, and numbers. Number one, accents. Accents in Spanish essentially help to indicate which syllable of a word should be stressed out when spoken out loud. The accents are placed above vowels, and whenever you say them, you put the emphasis of the sound on that vowel. Here's an example, and I'm using this example as an example. You don't have to know the rules for now. Yo hablo in Spanish means I speak. Don't worry about the conjugation. Yo hablo. That's the pronunciation. Yo hablo. However, el habló means he spoke. El, with an accent mark, means he, because without the accent, it means the article the masculine. And also, H's in Spanish are not pronounced. So whenever you see a word beginning with H followed by a vowel, just say the vowel as it is. It's not hablo or hablo, it's hablo, hablo. Hablo, hablo. That's accents in Spanish. Number two, question words. The best advice for these words is again, just to memorize them. These are the question words and in Spanish they look like this. Where is donde? When is cuando? What is que? Why is por qué? Who is quién? Which is cuál? How is como? And how much or how many is cuánto, cuánta, cuántos, cuántas? And also, whenever you write a question with them, you have to put an upside down question mark in the beginning. This is a rule in the language. And this is something good to remember. If you see these words with accents, the words are used as literal questions. Sometimes que, without an accent mark, can mean that, as in the sentence, I wanted to tell you that I'm happy. Sometimes donde, without an accent mark, can mean where I came from. I'm not using it as a question, I'm using it as a location. Additionally, por qué means why, because you can see the word being split and the emphasis is put on the que part. However, if you were to combine them together, pronounced 
Porque, this word means because. Porque is why. Porque is because. The last thing to note is that some question words have genders and plurality. For example, if I ask quienes, I'm asking about who as in multiple people instead of one person. Another example is how many. If I say cuantas, I'm saying how many for them, feminine, because the ending a is most of the time feminine in Spanish. If I say cuantos, I'm saying how many for them, masculine, because the ending o is most of the time masculine in Spanish. Number three, prepositional words and adverbs. Prepositional words can be fanboys, such as for and nor, but or yet so, and as a bonus, by. For is para, and is e, nor is ni, but is perro. Make sure that you have one R, because two R's, perro, this would be Spanish for dog. Or is o, yet is used as still, as in the sentence, I studied for my test, yet I failed. I studied for my test, but still I failed. This word is actually used as perro, or sin embargo. So is así que, and by is por. Now we have some adverbs. If is si, no accent, because with an accent you have si, which means yes. Then is entonces, also is también. Of and from both mean de, but the meaning changes in context. With is con, to is a, in and on is en, and each is cada. Just make sure you know this information. Number four, Pronouns. I'll use this 2 by 3 chart to first explain their position of order in English. In English, you have I, you, he, you can also include she, but I'll say he just to put up some space. We, the pronoun in the fifth position, is actually you all, or y'all. English doesn't have this pronoun, but I will still include it because Spanish has it. And finally, they. These are the pronouns in Spanish. Yo, tu, with an accent, because without the accent, it means tu, which is your. El, you can also say ella or usted, and usted actually means you formal, like when you're talking to a professional person. Nosotros is masculine, and nosotras is feminine. These pronouns have genders. Vosotros is you all masculine, and vosotras is you all feminine. And ellos is they masculine, ellas is they feminine, and ustedes is you all formal. Try not focusing on these pronouns, because you will rarely use them in conversation. Make sure you know the main ones, like yo, tú, él, and nosotros. Number five, days of the week. Monday is the lunes, Tuesday is martes, Wednesday is miércoles, Thursday is jueves, viernes, sábado, domingo. You don't have to capitalize these words in Spanish as you do in English. Number six, months. Once again, you don't have to capitalize these in Spanish. Enero, febrero, marzo, abril, mayo, junio, julio, agosto, septiembre, octubre, noviembre, diciembre. Number seven, seasons. Verano, Otoño, invierno, primavera. Number eight, time words. And some of these have genders, such as second, which is segundo or segunda. This can also mean second as in a position, I'm in second place, but the meaning changes in context. Minute, which is minuto or minuta. You can say unos minutos or unas minutas, which both mean some or a few minutes. Hour is hora, week is semana, month is mes, Year is año. Make sure you put the ñ because without it, you have ano, which is anus. Yesterday is ayer. Today is hoy. And tomorrow is mañana. Mañana can also mean morning, but the meaning changes in context. And last one, number nine, numbers. Now, I'm not going to write every single number down because this will be a long video, but I'll give the syntax of how to say numbers. And from there, you can say numbers on your own. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, siete, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. There is no point of listing numbers past 20 because all you do is take 20 and then add any number you want to it. But it has to be written as one word, like 22 or 23 and so on. 30 is 30 y and whatever number you want, like 30 y 2. 40 is 40 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 1000, and 1 million, million. The last concept is positions of numbers, and these have genders. First is primero or primera. Second is segundo or segunda. It can also mean second as in time. I already covered that. Tercero, tercera. Cuarto, cuarta, also Cuarto can mean room or quarter of the time, but the meaning again changes in context. Quinto, quinta, sexto, sexta, 
séptimo, séptima, octavo, octava, noveno, novena, décimo, décima. There is no point of learning numbers beyond that, and it's actually a concept I'll cover in a future video. So for now, I want to say that this is it for this video. What I covered in this video is the fundamentals that you would need to start speaking Spanish. They all begin here. And of course, if you don't memorize all of them, you can always use a translator to translate the word that you forgot, and then it will be locked in your mind. Accents, question words, prepositional words and adverbs, pronouns, days of the week, months, seasons, time words, and numbers. Spanish has a lot of verbs and a lot of conjugation for those verbs. And in this video, I'll go in depth and explain how this fundamental actually works. I like to call this the primary fundamental of Spanish because it's the first system of the language where you'll need to think in terms of translation, unlike memorization from the previous video. Conjugation basically means that you're modifying a verb so that it fits the pronoun that you're writing the verb into. And speaking of pronouns, here's their syntax in case you forgot from the previous video. I'd also like to focus not just on important verbs that you have to know and how to conjugate, but also on which pronouns to concentrate on the most because some pronouns are used way more often than others, like yo, tu, and el are used way more often than nosotros, vosotros, and ellos. I'd first like to present what the idea of verb conjugation looks like in English to give you a base that you can relate to. The reason why English is a very easy language is because it has a very minimal syntax and it doesn't really have a lot of variety in terms of conjugation. If I want to use the verb to eat, it will look like this in English. And keep in mind that this is just the present form and also that the way you figure out verbs in English is by the preposition to. To eat, to walk, to tell, to do, whatever. But in Spanish, in order to determine if a word is a verb, it has to end in AR, ER, or IR. But let's focus on English for a second. In English, you say, I eat, you eat, he eats. You can also say she or it eats, but we're focusing on pronouns that you would use realistically. We eat, you all eat. There is no you all in English, but I will still include it because Spanish has it. And then they eat. Looking at the syntax, there's really not much in terms of conjugation because eat stays eat for 80% of the pronouns and you only add an S in the he pronoun because that's the syntax of the language. In Spanish, there are verbs ending in AR, ER, and IR, like hablar, comer, and vivir. Here are the meanings, and let's start with verbs ending in AR. The way that conjugation works in Spanish is by dropping off the ending of the verb, like hablar, and then you add the corresponding conjugation that fits the pronoun. Unlike the two conjugations that you have in English, Spanish has six of them. To conjugate simple verbs ending in AR, you first drop the ending of the verb and then apply the ending that corresponds with the pronoun. For yo, you put o. For tú, you put as. For él, or ella usted, you put a. For nosotros, or nosotras, but again we're focusing on the pronouns you'll use the most when speaking. So for nosotros, you put amos. For vosotros, you put ais, with an emphasis on the a, ais. And for ellos, you put an. Let's use the verb hablar, which is a verb you'll use a lot when you speak. How would you conjugate the verb hablar in the yo form? You take hablar, drop the ending, and you add o. So you get hablo. The more you try this concept, the faster you'll get it. For tú, you get hablas. For él, or ella usted, you get habla. For nosotros, you get hablamos. For vosotros, you get habláis. And for ellos, you get hablan. Try not concentrating on these pronouns because the sentences that you can make with them are very minimal. All you have to know for now is how to conjugate verbs ending in AR using every pronoun, but you don't necessarily need to make a thousand sentences with them. If you were to make phrases as examples, try focusing more on these pronouns. One important thing to note is that the same system for conjugation works for almost every AR verb out there, but I will not focus on all of them because there is no point. Plus, there are verbs like gustar and pensar that are topics for future videos. And also, I don't like giving examples whenever I show the first fundamental of Spanish, because I believe that when you're learning the beginning, you can generate examples on your own by simply translating new vocabulary that you encounter in your personal life. Plus, as I said, as long as you know how to conjugate verbs, you're good to go, because by learning how to say yo hablo, you can already say many sentences like yo hablo español, yo hablo ruso, or yo hablo contigo. You already said a few sentences with the words yo hablo, and you can probably say more based on whatever you want to say. Next up, there are verbs ending in er, and these verbs follow a similar syntax as verbs ending with ar. For yo, you drop the ending of the verb and you put o. For tu, you put s. For el, or ella usted, you put e. For nosotros, you put hemos. For vosotros, you put ace, with an emphasis on the e, ace. And for ellos, you put n. Using the verb comer as an example, how would you conjugate the verb comer in the yo form? You take comer, drop the ending, and add o. So you get como. This word can also mean like, as in the sentence, like I told him yesterday, but the meaning changes in context. For tú, you get comes. For él, you get come. For nosotros, comemos. For vosotros, coméis. And ellos, 
Comen. As I said again, try not concentrating on these pronouns because the phrases that you can make with them are mainly pointless. There is no point in knowing how to conjugate every single ER verb because you'll never use all of them. I'm just using a useful verb like comer in order to show you how to conjugate regular ER verbs. The last concept is verbs ending in IR. For yo, you drop the ending of the verb and put O. For tu, you put S. For el, you put E. For nosotros, you put imos. For vosotros, you put is with an emphasis on the i, is, and for ellos, you put en. You might also notice that the pronouns yo, tu, el, and ellos all use the same syntax as verbs ending in er, which makes the language more convenient. Using the verb vivir as an example, for the yo pronoun, you take vivir, drop the ending, and add o, so you get vivo. For tu, you get vives. For el, you get vive. For nosotros, you get vivimos. Vosotros, vivis. Ellos, viven. As I said again, there is no point in knowing how to conjugate every single IR verb because you'll never use all of them. So for now, I want to say that this is it for this video. I could have made it a longer video where I gave examples and maybe quizzed you on some of the topics that I showed today, but I prefer not to. I choose to end the concept here because I believe that this is a sufficient amount of information that one would need to know in order to understand verbs better. In this video, I just explained the fundamental of AR, ER, and IR verb conjugation. Later, you can start making sentences using different verbs and expressing any thought that you have in mind in Spanish. This is the main fundamental of Spanish. Spanish has two types of articles, definite and indefinite articles. Definite articles speak of the article the in English, and it's also known as the article that specifies something, such as the book. Indefinite articles speak of a and or some, also known as articles that generalize things, like a book. In Spanish, both types of articles have gender and plurality. The definite article the in Spanish is el, the masculine and singular, and la, feminine and singular. El libro means the book, and we know that this article is masculine because the ending of the noun that follows the article is masculine. Most nouns in Spanish that end in o tend to be masculine, so we have to put the masculine definite article el. Likewise, we do the same with the feminine article. La piscina means the pool. We know this article is feminine because it corresponds with the noun after it, which is feminine. Most nouns in Spanish that end in a tend to be feminine, so we have to put the feminine definite article la. If we want to pluralize the articles, el becomes los and la becomes las. So los libros would be the books and las piscinas would be the pools. Indefinite articles look like this in Spanish. Un is a or an, masculine and singular, and una is a or an, feminine and singular. Un libro would be a book, and una piscina would be a pool. Also, it's really important not to say uno libro, because if we say that, we're saying one book instead of a book. We're working with articles, not numbers. So, if we want to pluralize them, we say unos libros, some books, and unas piscinas, some pools. There are, however, a few strange words in Spanish, and we need to cover those too, such as clase and carne. They both end with e, but they actually use the feminine article la. So la clase is the class, and la carne is the meat. Other words may end in dad, such as as ciudad and universidad, and those also use the feminine article la. So la ciudad is the city and la universidad is the university. You might also find words ending in sion, which is the English version of words ending in tion, and these words also tend to use the feminine article la. So la acción is the action. At last, you might find a few exceptions like problema and programa, and you would think that these words are feminine because they end in a, but actually they end in ma. And words that end in ma in Spanish use the masculine article el. el el problema is the problem and el programa is the program. Two more common words is dia and agua. And you want to say that those are feminine because they end in a, but they actually use the masculine article el. El dia is the day and el agua is the water. There's also this word, foto, and this word actually uses the feminine article la because foto is short for fotografia. It ends in a, so you want to put la in the beginning. The verb ser in Spanish means to be as in being or existing, and its syntax looks like this in English. I am, you are, he or she it is, we are, y'all are, English doesn't have this pronoun, but I'm still including it because Spanish has it, and they are. Part of the reason why English is an easy language is because the conjugation of these verbs stays the same for most pronouns. Are is the same for we, they, and you, but they change for I and he. In Spanish, however, you have six different conjugations for each pronoun. And actually, the verb ser is an irregular verb, meaning that you cannot conjugate it like regular verbs. And its syntax completely changes in every pronoun. It looks like this in Spanish. Yo soy, tú eres, él, or ella usted es, nosotros somos, vosotros sois, and ellos son. The best advice that I can give is to just memorize these conjugations because there is no conjugation pattern to follow with them, but also try not focusing on these pronouns because they're not used as often as the other ones in conversation. However, ser is not used the same as it's used in English. 
You might have heard teachers use nursery rhymes to describe this verb, saying who are you and from where, always use the verb ser, or some teachers might also say that the verb and you are from Spain, you will say yo soy español y yo soy de España. The conjugation soy is used here because you're talking about yourself and the same principle applies to the rest of the pronouns based on whichever conjugation you want to work with. Number two, occupation. If you want to say that he is a professor, you would say el es profesor. Also, you don't have to put an indefinite article like un before profesor because it's a rule in Spanish. So you would just say el es profesor. He is a professor. The same principle applies to the rest of the conjugations and whichever occupation you decide to say. Number three, physical traits. If you want to say you are beautiful, you will say tu eres bonito or bonita depending on the person. And the reason you use ser is because it's a trait that applies to the person all the time. By saying you are beautiful, tu eres bonito, you're saying that the person is beautiful always. He was born beautiful, he's beautiful now, and he will die beautiful. Number four, generalizations. If you want to say it is important to work, you would say es importante trabajar. In Spanish, there is no notion of starting a sentence with the word it, so you'll immediately start it with is. Es importante trabajar. Number five, when and where are events taking place? If you want to say the party is in the club, you would say la fiesta es en el club. Similarly, you can say the party is at six, which would be la fiesta es a las seis. The rule here is to always include a las if the number is plural or more than one. And speaking of time, it's the last most important use of the verb ser, time and date. You can say a simple sentence like it's Friday, which would be a generalization and time, and it would be es viernes. However, when you start to speak of time, as in a clock, this is where the syntax gets slightly tricky. If you want to say it's 1 p.m., the sentence would be es la una de la tarde. It begins with es but throws a definite article la because it uses una as a feminine number. So it's the one in the afternoon or of the afternoon. Make sure that you include the article la but primarily focus on the es because when you include numbers that are more than one, the amount of time becomes plural. If you want to say it's 2 p.m., you would say son las dos de la tarde because now we have plurality. Now the sentence is in plural because we have a non-singular digit. So instead of saying es for for one, you would say son for two, and pluralize la for las, and then you'd say son las dos de la tarde, it's the two in the afternoon. The same principle applies to other numbers of time, such as son las tres or son las cuatro de la tarde. So these are the uses of the verb ser in Spanish. And as a matter of fact, the easiest way to remember them is to always remember that the verb ser applies to factual statements about oneself. In case you weren't paying close attention, everything that I've listed in this video were examples that apply factually about yourself. By saying soy Alex, I'm factual actually stating that my name is Alex and I cannot change that fact. If I say soy bonito, I'm factually stating that I'm a beautiful person in general. By saying es lunes, I'm factually stating that it's Monday today. By saying son las dos de la tarde, I'm factually stating that it's two in the afternoon right now. Everything that I've listed in this video were factual statements and now you understand why some teachers in schools say that the verb ser applies to permanent traits because these are all factual statements. The present progressive in Spanish is the English version of verbs ending in ing or as they're formally called infinitives. Infinitives are verbs that are placed after already conjugated verbs and so they don't change or slightly get modified. With the present progressive, if you want to use the verb to talk, you would say I am talking by adding an ing to the infinitive. I is the subject, am is the conjugated verb to be for the I pronoun and talking is the infinitive that gets the ing added to it. Both in English and Spanish, the present progressive indicates that an action is being done right now, which means that there is progress happening in the present. However, the ing version of English looks different in Spanish. At first, if you want to start a sentence in the present progressive in Spanish, you would begin by saying yo estoy, which means I am. Estoy is actually an irregular conjugation of the yo pronoun said from the verb estar, which means to be. There are different conjugations for this verb with different pronouns, but the topic of this verb is for a future video. In Spanish, you have verbs ending in ar, er, and ir, but their infinitive version of the present progressive is actually quite easy to remember. For verbs ending in ar, you would want to remove the ending of the verb and then add the ending ando. Using the verb hablar in the present progressive, you would say yo estoy hablar, remove the ending and then add ando as the ending of the infinitive. So this way you get yo estoy hablando, which means I am speaking. The same principle applies to the rest of the pronouns and any infinitive that you want to use. But keep in mind that there are six different conjugations for the verb estar, which apply to their corresponding pronouns. And as I said again, the verb estar is for a future video. For verbs ending in er and ir, remove the ending of the verb and then add the ending yendo. Using comer and vivir in the present progressive, you would say yo estoy comiendo and yo estoy viviendo, which is I am eating and I am living. The same principle applies to the rest of the pronouns and any infinitive that you want to use, but once again, remember to use the right conjugation of each pronoun. At last, you might encounter a few exceptions in Spanish where modifying some infinitives might require a bit more modification to make the verbs sound better when spoken. For instance, you might see the verb leer, which means to read, and you would want to say yo estoy leyendo, but this would be a mistake in Spanish because Spanish has a rule that says
says you cannot have three vowels next to each other, so you have to modify one of them with a consonant to eliminate the repetitive pronunciation when the word is said. So instead of saying leyendo, you would say yo estoy leyendo, which means I am reading, and the same concept applies to any pronoun you want to use. You might also find this verb, dormir, which means to sleep, and you would want to say yo estoy dormiendo, but because dormir is a stem changing verb, you have to change the stem of the verb to make its pronunciation sound better. So instead of saying yo estoy dormiendo, you would say yo estoy durmiendo, which means I am sleeping. And the same idea applies to the rest of the pronouns. There is, however, another stem changing verb in Spanish, like decir, which means to say. You would want to say yo estoy deciendo, but Spanish says that you have to change the stem of the verb to make it sound better. So instead of saying deciendo, you would say yo estoy diciendo, which would mean I am saying, and once again, the same principle applies to the rest of the pronouns. The verb estar in Spanish means to be, as in being or existing. Unlike the weird conjugations with the verb ser, the verb estar actually follows the normal syntax of conjugating regular AR verbs, and it looks like this in Spanish. Yo estoy, tú estás, él or ella está, nosotros estamos, vosotros estáis, and ellos están. Before I explain the primary uses of the verb estar, I first need to note a few important things about this verb. Just visually looking at its syntax, you can probably tell that the conjugation for the yo pronoun is irregular because it ends with a y. And this is done specifically to not get it confused with the demonstrative adjective esto. Esto means this in the neutral form. Whenever you're referring to something and you don't know what it is, you will always say que es esto, indicating what is this without knowing if the object you're referring to is masculine or feminine. Another important thing to note with estar is that the pronouns tú, él, and ellos all have accents on the a, and this is also done on purpose, because if you were to remove the accents, you would have different words. These words, pronounced estas and esta, mean these and this feminine. But with the accents, they mean you are and he or she is. So it's really important to put accents on them and put the emphasis on the a. As always, try not focusing on these conjugations, because they're not used as often as the other ones in conversation. Now, the most important thing to note about the verb estar is that even though it means to be, as in being, its uses are completely different from the verb ser, which I explained in one of my previous videos. The verb estar mainly applies to these uses, the present progressive, location, and health, conditions, and emotions. Number one, the present progressive. The present progressive is something that I explained in the video before this one, so you should be familiar with the syntax. But now, this is where we can start using the conjugations that apply to other pronouns. For instance, if you want to say that he is running, you would use the conjugated verb estar for the he pronoun, which would be el está corriendo. If you want to say you are thinking, you would say tú estás pensando. Both of these verbs are actions that are happening right now, which explains why the verb estar is used here. And the same principle applies to any pronoun and verb that you want to use in the present progressive. Number two, location. And whenever I speak of location, I speak of spatial relationships relative to where something or someone is as of this moment. You might have heard the saying, donde estas tu, which means where are you? The reason why the verb estar is used here is because the question is asking where one is right now. And if you're answering this question, you will likewise use the verb estar by saying yo estoy and whichever location you want to say. Using location with estar can also indicate where something or someone is relative to a different object. When asking donde estas tu, you can also reply with yo estoy al lado de la casa, which would mean I am next to the house or to the next of the house. And the reason why estar is used here is because it uses a location in relation to something else. The same principle applies to any pronoun, verb, and location you want to use. And the last usage to know with the verb estar is health, conditions, and emotions. And this is by far the trickiest use of the verb estar because it's the number one concept that most students struggle with. Whenever I refer to conditions and emotions, I'm talking about adjectives that people use to refer to something that they feel right now and not a physical trait. You might remember me saying that the verb ser is used for physical traits and while that's true, the conditions and emotions of people and sometimes objects primarily refer to something that somebody feels rather than being a factual statement. Looking at this example, both the words alto and feliz are adjectives but one is a factual and physical trait while the other is an emotion that changes over time. While the verb ser refers to factual statements, part of which includes physical traits which are factual about oneself, the adjective is using the conjugation s because the verb ser refers to factual statements. Statements. El es alto, he is tall, is a factual statement because you cannot change that fact. However, once you start including emotions, this is where you need to have a different sense of being. Because by saying yo estoy feliz, I am happy, I'm indicating that I'm feeling happy and that my feeling will change in time rather than this being a factual statement about me. If
If you were to switch them and say, el está alto, and yo soy feliz, this is where the meaning in both sentences completely changes. By saying, el está alto, you're basically saying that he is feeling tall rather than him factually being tall, which would be an incorrect use of the verb estar because the verb estar refers to conditions and emotions that actively change over time. Alto means tall and masculine, which is an adjective that refers to a physical and factual trait about oneself rather than a feeling. By saying, yo soy feliz, I'm saying that I am happy, as in I am a happy person in general. I was born happy, I'm happy now, and I will die happy, all of this being a false statement. Because happiness is a feeling that changes over time, it doesn't allow the verb said to be used here. So instead, you would want to look carefully at the difference between physical and factual traits about oneself and conditions and emotions that change over time. And with conditions and emotions, you might find these phrases and adjectives to be the most practical. And 99% of the time, they all use the verb estar because all of these conditions are emotions that change over time and don't remain factual. I am good, estoy bien, indicates that I'm feeling good rather than me being a good person in general. You are busy, estás ocupado, indicates that you are busy as of this moment, and you will not be busy in the future, which doesn't allow the statement to be factual about you. Hence, estar is used. The doors are open, las puertas están abiertas, this means that the doors are open now, but their condition will probably change in the future. And also, you might have noticed that the ending of some of these adjectives end in o or as, and that is because adjectives in Spanish have gender and plurality. And as a matter of fact, I will describe the concept of adjectives in the video after this one. Hopefully, I'm making myself as clear as possible with what to do with the verb estar. And in case you still don't understand the concept, the verb estar mainly applies to uses that are happening right now, at this moment, and they're most likely to change in the future. Just like I listed examples in my said video, the uses of the verb estar likewise have a connective pattern across all examples that I used in this video. There are other uses of the verb estar, like weather expressions, but they're not as important as the primary uses in this video. The present progressive, location, and conditions and emotions are the primary uses of the verb estar, and all of these uses have a connection and that is they're happening right now. By saying, él está corriendo, I'm saying that he is running right now, but he will not be running in the future. By saying, yo estoy en la casa, I'm saying that I'm in the house right now, but I will not be in the future. By saying, tú estás ocupado, I'm saying that you are busy right now, but you will not be in the future. When you really think about it, it makes sense why Spanish has two verbs for being or to be, because half the time you utilize verbs that describe you factually and these can never change, but on the other half of the time, you're describing yourself using traits that apply for the moment. And now, you might also understand why some teachers say that the verb said applies to permanent traits, while estar refers to temporary traits because some conditions last forever while others happen right now. Spanish has many different types of adjectives, and in this video, I would like to explain how descriptive adjectives work in context. And by descriptive adjectives, I mean adjectives that physically or conditionally describe something or someone. In Spanish, all adjectives have gender and plurality, with the exceptions of a few words that have a neutral ending but still follow plurality. Adjectives ending in o are masculine, adjectives ending in a are feminine, and neutral adjectives vary based on whoever the subject is of the sentence. If you want to say that you are tall and beautiful, you would say yo soy alto y bonito if you're referring to someone that's masculine, and alta y bonita would refer to someone who is feminine. If you were to say that they are ugly and masculine, you would say ellos son feos, because now there are multiple people which generates plurality. If you were to work with adjectives that have a neutral ending and say a sentence like these classes are easy, you would say estas clases son faciles, by adding an es at the end of the adjective to fit the plurality of the sentence. If you were to say we are intelligent, you would say nosotros somos inteligentes, because the ending of the adjective matches the plurality of the sentence. The same exact principle applies to any pronoun and adjective you would like to use. However, taking simple sentences like the boy is smart, el chico es inteligente, might make learning too impractical because you're generating sentences that are too easy to say, or sentences that are not said as often as others. If you were to instead say the smart boy, this is where the syntax would start changing positions in the sentence. You would want to say el inteligente chico, the smart boy, but this would be a mistake in Spanish because Spanish has a rule that says you have to put nouns before adjectives in order to determine the subject from something else. So instead of saying el inteligente chico, you would say el chico inteligente, which technically would translate as the boy smart, but logically speaking, it means the boy that is smart, but this is not included in Spanish because it doesn't need to. In English, whenever you're describing subjects, you put adjectives before nouns, but in Spanish you have to put adjectives after nouns because it's a rule in the language. And once again, the same principle applies to any noun and adjective you want to use. There is, however, an important rule to consider whenever you're referring to adjectives that are used factually and physically about oneself, and an adjective that is a condition that changes over time. In English, you may have sentences like I am short and I am tired, and both of these sentences use the same conjugated form of the verb to be, in this case I am, because in English we don't care about the continuation of the sentence as long as we use the properly conjugated form of to be to match the corresponding pronoun. In Spanish, however, you have to watch out for these things because these sentences contain two senses of being. One using a physical and factual trait about yourself, while the other expresses an emotion that you feel which will change in the future. And with descriptive adjectives, the same rule applies for both adjectives that apply factually 
freely and conditionally. The only challenge is figuring out whether to use ser or estar with physical traits and conditions and emotions. La chica hermosa, the beautiful girl, can also be said as la chica es hermosa, the girl is beautiful, which uses ser to factually describe the subject. El hombre relajado, the relaxed man, can also be rephrased as el hombre está relajado, the man is relaxed, which uses the verb estar to express the emotional condition of the subject. And with these being physical traits that are used with ser, and these being conditions that are used with estar, these are all commonly used descriptive adjectives that you can use to construct sentences on a daily basis. All you simply do is choose any pronoun you want to use, select any adjective, and then remember which verb to use when describing something or somebody. For example, if you want to say that he is smart, you would say el es inteligente, because the word es is the correctly conjugated form of ser, of the said, you would say nosotros estamos tristes, and you would use estamos as the conjugated form of the we pronoun, because estar is used for emotions that change over time. And you would also pluralize triste, because you have plurality in the sentence. Possessive adjectives in Spanish indicate that something is being possessed by somebody or is in the own hands of somebody. The English version of this would be my, your, his, her, or its, our, y'alls. English doesn't have this adjective, but I'm still including it because Spanish has it. And finally, there. In Spanish, these possessive adjectives look like this. Me, with no accent, because with the accent, you'll have a direct object pronoun, me. Tu, with no accent, because with the accent, you have the pronoun you. Su, and this adjective can simultaneously mean his, her, or their, and you can only tell the difference between them in context. And finally, nuestro, nuestra, vuestro, vuestra. One of the interesting things about possessive adjectives in Spanish is that the adjectives nuestro and vuestro are the only adjectives that have gender. If you're referring to something masculine in Spanish and you want to use the our adjective, you would say nuestro and then whatever the follow-up is. You can do the same with nuestra using feminine words, and you can replicate this concept using the vuestro adjective. However, I recommend not focusing on these adjectives because they're not used as often as the other ones in Spanish. And also, all of these possessive adjectives have plurality. And the way that you pluralize them is by simply adding an S at the end of every adjective. And with plurality, you can only use it when you're referring to nouns that are not singular. For example, if you want to say my car, you would say mi coche. But saying my cars would be mis coches. If you want to say your dog, you would say tu perro. And saying your dogs would be tus perros. However, using the su adjective is where the syntax gets a bit tricky. And like I said again, this adjective can mean his, her, and their, it can be pluralized, and you can only tell the difference between them in context. You can have a sentence in English like, I talk with his friend, and in Spanish, the sentence would be, yo hablo con su amigo. In English, understanding the adjective is very easy, because we have an adjective that specifies who it is, in this case, it's masculine. In Spanish, however, it would be difficult to tell if su refers to his, her, or their. A tip that I can give to not get these confused is to always specify who is the subject within the sentence that you're saying. You can say a sentence like, I talk with John, and with his father, and in Spanish, the sentence would be yo hablo con John y con su padre. And in this context, you would know that the adjective su is masculine and indicates his, because John is a masculine name. Likewise, you can have a sentence like I talk with Emma and with her mother, and in Spanish, the sentence would be yo hablo con Emma y con su madre. And in this context, we know that su is feminine and indicates her, because Emma is feminine. At last, you can have a sentence that utilizes two adjectives and you can pluralize them both. Like I talk with my parents and with their friends, and in Spanish, it would be yo hablo con mis padres y con sus amigos. Mis is pluralized because padre is a plural noun, and sus is also pluralized because of amigos, but it mainly refers to the adjective there because of my parents' friends, which is their friends. Using this system is actually quite useful to keep these possessive adjectives in the back of your mind because the sentences that you can make with them are practical and limitless. And once again, the same principle applies to any sentence you want to say using these adjectives. Demonstrative adjectives in Spanish are adjectives that are used to indicate a specific word or precisely determine what something is. In English, it's very easy to decide on these adjectives because you have only two primary words that determine something. And these words are this and that. And if you want to pluralize them, this becomes these and that becomes those. In Spanish, you have the same concept along with a bit more variety, gender, and plurality. In Spanish, this would be este, masculine, and esta, feminine, and that would be ese, masculine, and esa, feminine. It's really tempting to say esto or eso because the feminine version ends in a, so you want to put an o for the masculine adjectives. However, Spanish does have these words, esto and eso, but these are adjectives that have the neuter gender, meaning that you don't know if these adjectives refer to something masculine or feminine. Roughly 80% of the time, you would use these words in sentences like que es esto or que es eso, meaning what is this or what is that. These are simple sentences to remember whenever you decide to 
speak Spanish. Additionally, you can also use these words for making sentences that have generalizations, such as this is for everybody, esto es para todos. And the same concept applies to eso and any continuation that you want to say. Overall, you just have to remember that este and ese are masculine and esta and esa are feminine. If you want to pluralize them both, este and esta become estos and estas and ese and esa become esos and esas. Visually looking at the syntax, the plurality for esta and esa is very simple because all you do is put an s at the end of the adjectives, but for este and ese, the ending changes to estos and esos. And that's the only tough part to remember. And also, remember to not put accents on esta and estas, because if you do, you will have different words. Additionally, Spanish also has these words, aquel and aquella, both of which mean that, as in something that's over there. If you want to pluralize them, aquel becomes aquellos, and aquella becomes aquellas. Even though this demonstrative adjective is used less than the others, it's actually helpful to say in some cases. But moreover, it's important to just know these words and understand when to use them. Regarding examples, you can use este and ese with masculine nouns like este libro and esta casa. You can use ese and esa with feminine nouns like ese curso and esa mesa. And if you want to pluralize any of them, you would have estos libros, estas casas, esos cursos, and esas mesas. Using these demonstrative adjectives, you can actually make many sentences with them, especially when you're trying to determine something. And once you have enough practice, you'll find these words to be very useful and practical. You've probably heard many phrases in Spanish used for greetings and farewells, some of which are useful and some of which are kind of pointless. And in this video, I'd like to present to you what phrases are the best to use when saying greetings and farewells in Spanish. Bienvenido is probably the most popular greeting there is, which literally translates as welcome. If you break the word apart, you'll get bien in venido. Bien means well, and venido means come, which is a form of speech taken from the present perfect. Haber venido, to have come. And if you take that word, venido, and combine it with bien, you get bien venido. It's well to have come, or well come. And if you're referring to more than one person, you can also say bien venidos. Buenos dias literally translates as good days. And the ending of buenos perfectly corresponds to the ending of dias because it's pluralized and masculine. But mainly speaking, buenos dias is used more as good morning rather than good days. You also have this phrase, buenas noches, which is literally good nights or good night. When beginning a conversation in Spanish, a person might begin the conversation by immediately saying que pasa, which translates as what's going on. Because the verb pasar can actually mean to go or to happen, whenever somebody says que pasa, they're literally saying what's going on or what's happening. What's happening can also be rephrased as que está pasando, using the present progressive. And we know that it's the present progressive because it's using a conjugation of estar and adds ando at the end of the infinitive. And as a matter of fact, it's the same way the sentence works in English. You can say que pasa, que esta pasando, or maybe if you want to get fancy, you can say que tal. Que tal literally translates as what's such or what's the matter, but the meaning is mainly how are you. And the number one phrase that probably everybody heard when learning Spanish is como estas or como estas tu, which literally translates as how are you. And with this phrase, we know to use the verb estar to ask someone about their well-being because the verb estar mainly applies to actions and emotions that are happening right now, and so they're most likely to change in the future. By answering this question, you would say something like estoy bien because you're indicating that you're feeling good or feeling well which explains why your answer will also use a conjugation of estar. At last there's gracias or muchas gracias which means thanks or thank you very much and if you want to sound polite you'll reply with de nada which means of nothing indicating thank you very much and there is no need to thank me but overall de nada is mainly used as you're welcome. If you're leaving the conversation you might say something like adios or chao both of which mean bye or goodbye but the word adios can actually be broken down into two words, a and dios, which literally translates as to God. When Spanish was first originating as a language, the expression to God meant to have a good farewell, as in to God you go, but the meaning changed over time, which resulted simply in goodbye. There's also this phrase, hasta la vista, which is constructed using a preposition, article, and a noun, and it literally translates as until the view or until the next time I see you, or more of a sophisticated and modern meaning would be see you later. See you later can also be said as hasta luego, which which actually translates as until later. You might have also seen this phrase, hasta pronto, which translates as until soon, but its advanced definition means see you soon. And finally, hola means hello or hi, por favor means please, and perdón is a polite way of saying I'm sorry. The verb poder in Spanish means to can or to be able to, but it's mainly used as to can. In English, the syntax of this verb is very easy to remember because can literally stays can for the following six pronouns. In Spanish, however, you have six different conjugations for this verb, and it also falls into the category of stem-changing verbs. Stem-changing verbs in Spanish is actually a topic for a future video, but as far as the verb poder goes, stem-changing basically means that you have to take the stem of the verb and modify it in a way so that it sounds better when the word is said out loud. The verb poder 
poder falls into the o to u e category, which means that you'll take the stem of poder, po, and then change it to pue. However, this principle only applies to the yo, tu, el, and eos pronouns, and the ending of all of them correctly follows the regular syntax of verbs ending in er. For the nosotros and vosotros pronouns, the stem changing rule does not apply because Spanish says that these pronouns sound good enough when they're normally conjugated. Overall, you just have to know that the stem changing rule applies to the yo, tu, el, and eos pronouns. Another way to remember this is by looking at the shape of the 2x3 chart and seeing that it's shaped like a boot and so only pronouns within the boot will apply to the stem changing rule. Anything else outside of the boot will not use the stem changing rule. And every stem changing verb that you will encounter when learning Spanish will almost never use the stem changing rule for the nosotros and vosotros pronouns. The pronunciation goes as follows. Yo puedo, I can, tu puedes, you can, él or ella usted puede, he can, nosotros podemos, we can, vosotros podéis, y'all can, and ellos pueden, they can. As always, try not focusing on these pronouns because the phrases that you can make with them are not that useful. The only thing you should know about them is that they don't apply the stem changing rule. Fundamentally, the verb poder in Spanish is actually one of the most useful and practical verbs that there are because it's a universal verb that we subconsciously use in many sentences. Typically, the way the verb to can is used in English is by starting a sentence with a pronoun and can, such as I can, and then we immediately follow it up with an infinitive. In case you don't remember, an infinitive is a verb that's placed after an already conjugated verb that doesn't change or slightly gets modified. In this case, we can say a sentence like, I can speak Spanish, which will use I, can, and then speak will be the infinitive that's left untouched. And then you can plug in any language you want in the end. And in this sentence alone, I've used can three times. We can say a sentence like, I can speak Spanish, and you can plug in any language. In Spanish, I can speak Spanish would be, yo puedo hablar español. Puedo is the correctly conjugated form of poder of the yo pronoun, hablar is the infinitive that doesn't change form, and español is the language at the end. Of course, saying yo puedo hablar español doesn't actually mean that you can speak Spanish, because saying one phrase from memory does not indicate that you've mastered the language. In order for you to get better, you can actually use the verb poder to make many sentences that don't necessarily have to relate to languages. If you want to say a sentence like, you can learn English, you will say, tu puedes aprender inglés. If you want to say a sentence like, they can call by phone, you will say, ellos pueden llamar por teléfono. Overall, poder is probably one of the most convenient and helpful verbs there is, not only in Spanish and English, but in other languages in general. By understanding how to conjugate poder and knowing what phrases to use it with, you'll be able to generate any phrase that you want almost instantly, but this of course requires a bit more practice and examples that you can generate on your way. The verb ir in Spanish means to go, which is actually one of the trickiest and hardest verbs to work with, but in this video I'll simplify its principle to its most understandable way. At first, there are a few rules you should know about the verb to go in English so that you can utilize its principle and apply it to Spanish. The very first thing you should know about the verb to go is that it can use the present simple and the present progressive which actually generates two different meanings in context. For instance, saying I go indicates that I'm a person who likes to go in general, whereas saying I'm going means that I'm going right now, and so my action will change in the future. The reason why I'm mentioning this is because in English, these two phrases generate completely different meanings. However, because the verb ir is irregular in Spanish, it does not have a notion of the present progressive, and therefore, its principle uses both the present simple and the present progressive in unison, and it's something I'll cover in a few minutes from now. The second thing you should know about the verb to go is that there is a big difference between using to go as to go and to go to. For instance, I can say a sentence like I go there, or I'm going with my friends, and these phrases don't have the preposition position too because these are generic phrases that express ambiguity. On the other hand, I can say phrases like I'm going to the store or I'm going to the class which uses the preposition to to indicate a specific destination. Additionally, you can include infinitives with the preposition to and these sentences are actually used way more often than the other ones. You can say phrases like I'm going to do my homework or I'm going to read this book which utilize the preposition to with an infinitive which indicates an action that will be done in the close future. Overall, the syntax of to go is easy to remember in English because go stays go for five pronouns and only adds an ES for the he, she, it pronoun. However, learning this verb in Spanish requires a bit more thinking and analysis. At first, the verb to go in Spanish means ir, and it's actually a very strange and irregular verb because it's a monosyllabic verb. Monosyllabic verbs in Spanish basically means that the word has only one syllable, and so the language does not allow a normal conjugation pattern to be used with these words. If you want to conjugate a verb in Spanish, it has to end in AR, ER, or IR, you have to drop the ending, and then add the ending that corresponds to every pronoun. Similarly, the same can be done with infinity 
infinitives that slightly get modified in the present progressive, such as adding ando if a verb ends in ar or iendo if the verb ends in er or ir. Because ir is a monosyllabic verb, Spanish does not allow this verb to use any of the following principles that I just covered. So instead, it decides to use a different modification pattern that completely doesn't correspond with the verb ir itself. And speaking of monosyllabic verbs that follow irregular patterns, I've actually covered a verb like that in one of my previous videos, and that is the verb ser. The verb ser is a monosyllabic verb, so it's irregular, following a conjugation pattern that doesn't relate to the word ser itself. Whereas with the verb estar, you do have conjugations that follow the normal syntax of verbs ending in ar that drop the ending and then add the corresponding ending to every pronoun. Nonetheless, the verb ir has the same principle as the verb ser, where its conjugations don't relate to the verb ir. Technically speaking, ir does not even have an ending, and therefore you cannot drop its ending or add endings that correspond to every pronoun, both in the present simple and the present progressive, which might explain why Spanish creates a completely different syntax for this verb. The pronunciation goes as follows. Yo voy, I go, tu vas, you go, él or ello said, he goes, nosotros vamos, we go, vosotros vais, y'all go, and ellos van. They go. With the verb ir, I recommend that you actually focus on every pronoun besides vosotros because the phrases that you can make with them will be very useful and practical. The first rule that I've mentioned with to go in the beginning of the video was that it can be used as I go and I am going, which creates different meanings in context. However, as I said with the verb ir, Spanish doesn't allow this verb to be used in the present progressive, which changes the meaning of its context by making it use the present simple and the present progressive at the same time. In other words, whenever you decide to use ir in a sentence, like saying yo voy, this phrase simultaneously means I go and I am going. And the same principle applies to the rest of the pronouns. In English, both phrases have different meanings, but in Spanish, it means the same thing, which is also part of the reason why Spanish students struggle with this verb whenever they learn English. More than less, I am going is more of a sophisticated way of speaking in context, so basically, yo voy is used more as I'm going rather than I go. And you can make sentences like I go there, or I'm going with my friends, which in Spanish would be yo voy ahí and yo voy con mis amigos, which shows that voy stays voy in both sentences in Spanish, but in English, you have I go and I am going. And the same principle applies to the rest of the pronouns. And here, we get to the last rule of ir, which is something I've mentioned at the beginning of the video, and that is the difference between to go and to go to. In English, you can have phrases like, I'm going to the store, and with these sentences, you're using the preposition to to specify destination. On the other hand, you can do the same with infinitives, like saying, I'm going to do my homework, or I'm going to read this book, which will be, yo voy a hacer mi tarea, or yo voy a leer este libro. With these sentences, you're using the preposition to by applying it to the verb ir itself. And the same principle applies to any pronouns you want to use, but keep in mind the difference between to go and to go to. If you want to say a phrase like, you're going to work, you will say, tu vas a trabajar, which will use the preposition to. If you want to say, he goes to my house, you will say, el va a mi casa. If you want to say a sentence like, we go there with everybody, you'll say, nosotros vamos ahí con todos, which does not use the preposition to. If you want to say a sentence like, they're going to the university, you will say, ellos van a la universidad. Overall, I would say that the verb ir is an extremely useful verb in Spanish, even more so than poder and hacer, especially when you're trying to communicate with people who speak Spanish and tell them what you're trying to do or where you go. The verb tener in Spanish means to have, and it's actually a handy verb to use both in English and Spanish, but its concept is a bit tricky to use in Spanish, and in this video, I'll explain this verb as efficiently as possible. In English, the syntax of to have is easy to remember because have stays have for five pronouns and only changes to has in the he, she, it pronoun so that it sounds better for these pronouns. Like I said in my ir video, the verb tener likewise has tricky uses that are not that complicated. With ir, there's a big difference between saying to go and to go to. To go means to go somewhere in general, whereas to go to indicates that one will do something in the near future. The verb to have, both in English and Spanish, has the same concept of to have and to have to. To have indicates that one owns or possesses something, whereas to have to demonstrates that one has to do something in the close future. For instance, I can say a sentence like, I have a dog, which doesn't use the preposition to because I literally own something, but on the other hand, I can say I have to leave, which uses the preposition to because it indicates an action that will be done by me in the close future, with the addition of using an infinitive, leave, after, to. And in Spanish, the verb tener works the same exact way with a bit more variety. At first, the verb tener is actually a stem-changing verb, meaning that you have to change the stem of the verb to make it sound better when the word is said. Just like with the verb poder, the stem-changing rule will only apply in the tu, el, and ellos pronouns. In this case, the verb tener falls into the e to ie category, meaning that you take te and change it to te, and this stem will only apply 
in the two el and ellos pronouns. Nosotros and vosotros will not use the stem-changing rule because Spanish says that these words sound good enough when they're normally said. The ending of all conjugations perfectly follows the syntax of verbs ending in er, but the trickiest thing to remember with the conjugations of tener is that the yo pronoun is also irregular. By technicality, you would want to say yo tieno, but Spanish says that this word sounds bad when said, so instead, you would say tengo. Yo tengo means I have, and that's the syntax of the yo pronoun being irregular. Tu tienes, you have, el tiene, he has, nosotros tenemos, we have, vosotros tenéis, y'all have, and ellos tienen, they have. With the verb tener, I recommend that you focus on all pronouns except vosotros because the sentences that you can make with them are very useful. Just like I said in the beginning of the video, there's a big difference between using to have as to have and to have to. To have indicates that one possesses something, like I have a dog, and to have to means that one has to do something, such as I have to leave, following an infinitive after the preposition to. Both of these sentences work the same exact way in Spanish, but there's one slight difference that many people, especially students, fail to acknowledge, and that is the preposition to. You might remember me saying that with the verb ir, you'll need to put the preposition a after a conjugation of ir, like yo voy a la escuela, I'm going to the school, which uses a as to. With the verb tener, you might think to similarly use the preposition a, such as yo tengo a salir, I have to leave, but this would be wrong in Spanish. What you instead have to do is instead of using the preposition a, you have to use que as to. Instead of saying yo tengo a salir, you would say yo tengo que salir, which would mean I have to leave. I literally don't know why Spanish does that, but I do know that yo tengo que, I have to, indicates a modern meaning like I must, rather than I have to. So whenever you say yo tengo que salir, you're basically saying I have to leave or I must leave. And the same principle applies to any pronoun you want to use. With the verb tener, you have to use que as to in order to indicate something that you have to do. With the verb ir, you have to use the preposition a as to in order to indicate something that you're going to do. In English, you can say I have to do my homework or I'm going to do my homework. And in both phrases, the preposition to stays to. However, if you want to say these phrases in Spanish, you will say yo tengo que hacer mi tarea or yo voy a hacer mi tarea. And as you can see, Spanish uses que as the preposition to with the verb tener and a as the preposition to with the verb ir. In English, it stays the same, but in Spanish, it changes. And the amazing and useful part about phrases like this is that if you forget how to conjugate one of these verbs, you can always refer to the other one to express the same sentence. And that's actually a very skillful hack to remember whenever you speak Spanish. Just know that if you see que after a conjugation of tener, it means to have to. And if you see an a after a conjugation of ir, it means to go to. If you want to say a sentence like you have to pay, you will say tu tienes que pagar using the que preposition. If you want to say he has a cat, you will say el tiene un gato without adding the preposition que. If you want to say we have a class tomorrow, you'll say nosotros tenemos una clase mañana. If you want to say they have to read the books, you'll say ellos tienen que leer los libros. In case you want to practice with more examples, I recommend that you also say these sentences using the verb ir so that you know to use the preposition a with ir and que with tener. The more you try this concept, the faster you'll get it, especially when you start generating examples on your own. So overall, the verb tener is a very useful verb in Spanish, both both in terms of possession and future actions. Before I end the video, I would actually like to cover one last concept with the verb tener, and that's something that's not very practical to use, but it's something very important to know. And that is that the verb tener can sometimes express sentences with beings as in to be. You might remember my videos where I talked about the verbs ser and estar, both of which express permanent and temporary states of being, and while I did those videos, there was something very specific I did not mention in both of those videos, such as expressions with age, temperature, hunger, and maybe a few more. As a reference, consider these phrases in English. I am 19 years old, I am cold, and I am hungry. If I were to tell you to say these phrases in Spanish, you would probably say something like yo soy 19 años, yo estoy frío, and yo estoy hambre. And that's if you used ser and estar correctly. Some of you might make arguments that using ser and estar is the right way to go because by saying yo soy 19 años, I'm factually stating this about myself, which is why ser is used. And for phrases like estoy frío or estoy hambre, I'm using estar because I'm indicating that I'm feeling cold or hungry right now, and my feeling will change in the future. As crazy as it sounds, Spanish says that you cannot use the verbs ser and estar because these are expressions that indicate having a fact about oneself rather than factually being that oneself. Instead of using soy or estoy with these expressions, you will need to use tener and in this case, yo tengo. Instead of saying estoy 19 años, you'll say tengo 19 años because actually, I'm indicating that I have the age of 19 rather than me being 19. By saying tengo frío 
or tengo hambre, I'm indicating that I have a feeling of cold and I have a feeling of hunger. These expressions technically are not permanent nor temporary, which doesn't allow you to use the verb ser or estar. So instead, you have these feelings rather than being in these feelings. Of course, tener uses other feelings like these ones, but they're not as important as the other ones in conversation. And the same concept applies to any pronouns you want to use. Spanish has two types of prepositional phrases that when combined, eliminate repetition of sound. And that is al and del. Al is a combination of the words a and el, meaning to the masculine, and del is comprised from de and el, meaning from the or of the masculine. Spanish combines these words to eliminate the redundant sound of the same vowel when they're said. Saying a el sounds a bit weird, so Spanish combines the words and forms the word al, and does the same thing with del because saying de el is redundant. Al and del can be used both in context when you're only using the masculine definite article el. In case you want to use the feminine definite article la, you don't have to combine the words together, so you'll simply say a la or de la. As an example, you can say a sentence like I want to go to the bathroom, and in Spanish it would be yo quiero ir a el baño, but because baño is a masculine word, Spanish has to combine the preposition to with the masculine article, so you get al. Yo quiero ir al baño. I want to go to the bathroom. If you were to instead use a feminine word like clase, you would simply say yo quiero ir a la clase, without needing to combine the preposition with the article. Likewise, the same method can be used with del. If you want to say from the or of the, for instance, you can say he is from the market, which would be el es del mercado, and he is from the class would simply be el es de la clase. If you want to use del as of the, it would be useful to use it in a question like what do you suppose of the market? And in Spanish, it would be que supones del mercado. And of course, the same concept applies to any sentence you want to say in Spanish, but keep in mind that whenever you say to the or of the, you simply have to combine the words so that they sound better when they're said. Al and del. Now, there are pronouns after prepositions, which are also known as prepositional pronouns, and they're put after prepositional words, such as of, on, from, to, for, with, and more. And in English, they look like this. Me, you, him, her, it, us, all of you, and them. In English, there is no pattern to follow with any of these pronouns because some of them completely change while some stay the same, such as you, keeping the same form as the regular pronoun you. Contextually, you can use these prepositional pronouns and put them after prepositions, like what about me, this is on you, this is from him, take it to her, this is for us, we go with them. And of course, you don't necessarily have to use these phrases. In Spanish, however, the same idea also works for prepositional pronouns, and actually, their syntax is a lot easier to understand in Spanish. In Spanish, you have have me with an accent, ti, el or ella, nosotros, vosotros, and ellos or ellas. Just by looking at the syntax, you probably find it very strange that the he, we, y'all, and they pronouns haven't changed because when compared to their normal pronoun form, they stayed the same because Spanish decided to not change their form and keep their form as their regular pronoun form, aside from me and you. And telling the difference between pronouns and prepositional pronouns in Spanish can be done by simply looking if the word is after a preposition. You can have a simple sentence like, this is for us, and in Spanish, the phrase would be, esto es para nosotros. And as you can see, nosotros is placed after the preposition para, keeping its form and not changing, unlike English which uses us and completely changes the form, whereas in Spanish it stays the same and simpler to understand. Nonetheless, you can sometimes have sentences when you'll have the same pronoun and prepositional pronoun like they go with them, which would be ellos van con ellos. And at first, looking at this phrase is very weird because you have the word ellos not changing form, but actually ellos in the beginning is they and ellos in the end is them because it's placed after the preposition with. But once again, these are just the rules of Spanish. And you can make many more examples like, life is easy for her, la vida es fácil para ella, or you can go with us, tú puedes ir con nosotros, or you can have a tricky example, like, this gift is from him, este regalo es de él, with the ending being de él, not to be confused with del. Like I said at the beginning of the video, del is of the or from the masculine, which uses the definite article el, but de él means from him, because el doesn't change in Spanish when it's used as a prepositional pronoun. Even though it's a rare instance, you can still encounter these things when you learn Spanish. At last, there is one rule that you have to remember with the prepositional pronouns in Spanish, specifically relating to the preposition con, which is with. It's the only preposition in Spanish where if you place these prepositional pronouns after con, they will keep their form. But with me and ti, you have to combine con with the pronouns, which would be conmigo and contigo. So whenever you use prepositional pronouns with con, like do you want to go with me, you will say quieres ir conmigo? And you can reply with yes, I do want to go with you. Si, sí, quiero ir contigo. And in case you use the other prepositions with con, you don't have to modify them as you do with me and ti. And that's as far as pronouns after prepositions go. Direct object pronouns in Spanish are pronouns that take the form 
form of a direct object within a sentence in order to avoid repeating a noun in the sentence. As an example, take a look at this sentence in English. I buy a car. I is the subject, buy is the verb, and car is the object that's directly stated in the sentence. However, most of the time, we change the object from a noun to a pronoun whenever we speak. Instead of saying I buy a car, we can say I buy it. And now it becomes a direct object pronoun rather than a direct object noun. And you have to remember that a direct object pronoun is when a sentence has only one direct object, typically coming right after a conjugated verb in English. The phrase I buy a car has a subject, a verb, and only one direct object that's a noun. The phrase I buy it likewise has a subject, a verb, and one object that's a pronoun. And this is where you get the name direct object pronoun. And that's basically how direct object pronouns work in English. But the most important rule to remember is that a sentence has to have only one direct object, typically following a verb in English, regardless if it's singular or plural. And these direct object pronouns look like this in English. Me, you, him, her, it, us, all of you, and them. In Spanish, direct object pronouns work the same exact way with a bit more variety and they all share one rule that has to be applied most of the time and that is direct object pronouns in Spanish have to come before a verb rather than after a verb. In Spanish, direct object pronouns look like this. Me, te, lo or la, nos, os, and los or las. The first thing you should know about these pronouns is that the lo, la, los, and las pronouns are the only pronouns that have gender and plurality. While the other pronouns may refer to me, you, us, and all of you, lo, la, los, and las can also mean it or them as an object or a person. Lo can mean him or it masculine, la can mean her or it feminine, los can mean them masculine as in an object or a person, and las can mean them feminine, object or person. Once again, you have to remember that these pronouns come before a conjugated verb. Consider this phrase in Spanish. Yo compro un coche. I buy a car. In English, if you want to replace the object noun with an object pronoun, you would say I buy it, putting the it after buy. In Spanish, however, you cannot do that. So instead, you put the object pronoun before the conjugated verb. In this case, considering that coche is a masculine word, we need to use lo as the pronoun. You would want to say yo compro lo, but Spanish says that you have to put this pronoun before the verb. So instead, you will say yo lo compro. I buy it. I don't know why Spanish Spanish does that, but it's something that has to be known. And of course, you can generate many more examples in Spanish, and I even recommend that you do so because direct object pronouns in Spanish is a topic that I've personally seen many students struggle with. You can have phrases like, I want the books, yo quiero los libros, with los libros being them masculine, and you can instead say, I want them, which in Spanish would be, yo los quiero. You can also say something like, they have a house, ellos tienen una casa, but you can instead say, they have it, which would be, ellos la tienen. You can have simpler sentences like, I love you, which uses a pronoun immediately without needing to modify a noun for a pronoun, so the sentence would simply be yo te amo, I love you. You can repeat this concept with another pronoun that doesn't need to get modified like nos. You can say you watch, instead say she watches him, which would be ella lo mira. And the same concept applies to any sentence you want to say, but keep in mind the personal preposition a before you say a person's name. The last concept you should know with direct object pronouns in Spanish is that all of these pronouns can also be placed after infinitives, which actually makes your thinking process think a bit better and more similar to English than to anything else. Take this phrase for instance, I can see you. In Spanish, you would want to say, yo te puedo ver, and this sentence actually has no mistakes. However, there is a different way to say this phrase, and that is by attaching the direct object pronoun to the infinitive. You can say, yo te puedo ver, but you can also say, yo puedo verte, I can see you. It doesn't matter which phrase you say, because in case you forget how to say one phrase, you can always say the other. You can have examples like, they want to buy the books, ellos quieren comprar los libros, with los libros being the masculine pronoun, which would be, ellos los quieren comprar or ellos quieren comprarlos. You can also use direct object pronouns when speaking in the near future, such as I'm going to read it or I have to read it, which can be said as yo lo voy a leer and yo lo tengo que leer. Or if you want to simplify the order of the words, you can say voy a leerlo or tengo que leerlo. However, whenever you decide to attach a direct object pronoun to an infinitive, you have to remember that there are infinitives that don't change form, like in these phrases, but you can sometimes have infinitives that do get modified in the present progressive. You can say a sentence like you're watching me, which can be said as tu me estás mirando or tu estás mirándome. And both phrases have the same meaning, but with the second phrase, you have to put an accent on the infinitive to maintain the emphasis on that syllable. Tu estás mirándome. And you can say other phrases like they are reading it, ellos lo están leyendo or ellos están leyéndolo with an accent on the infinitive. Overall, you have to remember that you cannot attach direct object pronouns to conjugated verbs, only to infinitives. You cannot say something like yo compro lo, I buy it, because you have only one verb in 
in the sentence and the direct object pronoun is placed after the verb. But you can instead say, yo voy a comprarlo, I'm going to buy it, or yo estoy comprándolo, I'm buying it. Because in these cases, you're using one conjugated verb and one infinitive and the direct object pronoun is attached to the infinitive, not the conjugated verb. And the same concept applies to any sentence you want to say. And actually, I recommend many beginners to use direct object pronouns by attaching them to the end of infinitives because it makes your brain think in the same order of the words as you would use in English. You don't say in English, I it am buying, yo lo estoy comprando, but you instead say, I am buying it, yo estoy comprándolo. And the same concept basically applies to any sentence you want to say. Indirect object pronouns in Spanish are pronouns that take the form of an object noun in order to avoid repeating the same noun. In my previous video, I explained direct object pronouns in Spanish, and I explained that a direct object pronoun is when a sentence has only one direct object, typically coming right after a conjugated verb in English. An indirect object pronoun is actually quite different, and that is when a sentence has two objects, with the first object being a direct object and the second object being an indirect object. Take a look at this sentence in English. I buy a car for you. I is the subject, buy is the verb, car is a direct object noun because it comes first in the sentence, and you is the indirect object pronoun because it comes second in the sentence. In this video, I will only cover indirect objects in pronoun form because I already explained direct object pronouns in my previous video. Direct objects are objects that are first stated in a sentence, and indirect objects are objects that come second in a sentence. And in this video, all direct objects will be in the form of a noun, not a pronoun. And therefore, I will only cover indirect objects in pronoun form. In Spanish, they look like this. Me, which is me, te, which is you, le, and this pronoun can simultaneously mean to him or to her or a person's name, and I'll get to that in a bit. Nos, which is us, os, which is all of you, and less, which is them. As you can probably tell from looking at the chart, the me, you, us, and all of you pronouns have the same syntax as direct object pronouns, which makes the language more convenient. However, this is where we have less for them, as in people, and le, which can mean to him or to her and a person's name, and it's a tricky concept to understand, but I'll explain it as easily as possible. Looking back at this phrase, I buy a car for you, car is the direct object noun, and you is the indirect object that's already in pronoun form. Saying the sentence in Spanish can be done using multiple ways, but the essential point of the video is indirect object pronouns. We can hack the system by simply saying yo compro un coche para ti using a prepositional pronoun and while that saves us time we need to understand how indirect object pronouns work. Just like with direct object pronouns, indirect object pronouns likewise come before conjugated verbs and not after them. So saying the sentence in Spanish would simply be yo te compro un coche. I buy you a car or I buy a car for you. With the indirect object pronoun te acting as for you. And the same idea basically applies to the rest of the pronouns, but there are more things you should know about indirect object pronouns in Spanish, such as the pronoun le. Le can simultaneously mean to or for him or to or for her or a person's name, and in order to specify who you're talking about, you'll need to put the prepositional structure a plus a pronoun, like a él or a ella, which mean to or for him or her. Consider the sentence in English. She buys a car for him. Car is a direct object noun, while him is the indirect object pronoun pronoun, and as you can see, we have to use the pronoun le for him, and in Spanish, the phrase would be ella le compra un coche. And because we have a visual translation of him in English, we know that le means him. However, what if we don't have the phrase in English? Saying this phrase in Spanish, ella le compra un coche, we would know that the phrase means she buys a car for, but we don't know who the person is, because le can mean him, her, or a person's name. But le doesn't specify it. And this is where Spanish comes in and says to use the construction a, and then a pronoun, in this case, el. This construction can can actually be applied to any pronoun, but more than less, it's mainly used for the pronoun le, because it's the only pronoun that isn't specific enough. While we know that me is me, te is you, and so on, le can mean him or her, and we have to specify who it is with the construction a el. This construction has to be placed either in the beginning of a sentence or in the end. Looking at this phrase, she buys a car for him, in Spanish, the phrase would be a él, ella le compra un coche, or ella le compra un coche a él. It doesn't matter which phrase you say, but I recommend making sentences using the second phrase because it's similar to the order of the words in English. Ella le compra un coche a él might visually be translated as she, him, buys a car for him. And in English, it doesn't make sense to say this phrase because the language is specific enough with the pronouns. But in Spanish, it makes sense because the pronoun isn't specific enough. So the sentence would simply be she buys a car for him or she buys him a car. While the easy pronouns may be me, you, us, and all of you, I would like to focus on le for a bit because like I said, this pronoun can mean 
him, her, or a person's name, and here's what I mean. The phrase, she buys a car for him, can also be said as she buys a car for John, with John being an indirect object noun, which still works. Putting this phrase in Spanish is no different than simply saying, she buys a car for him, but the only difference is that instead of saying a él, we need to say, ella le compra un coche a John, just to specify who the person is. If we say, she buys a car for her, we can say, ella le compra un coche a ella. If we say, she buys a car for Emma, then we can say, ella le compra un coche a Emma, just to specify who the person is. And that's basically the toughest part to know with indirect object pronouns in Spanish, because I've seen many students failing to understand what le means and why every sentence has the construction a with a pronoun. And the last thing to note with indirect object pronouns in Spanish is that these pronouns can likewise be applied to infinitives the same exact way that direct object pronouns work. And I'll actually provide more examples in this video because indirect object pronouns are a tricky category in Spanish. How would you say this phrase in Spanish? He wants to buy you a book. You can say, el te quiere comprar un libro, or el quiere comprarte un libro. If you said any of these phrases, then you did a good job. How would you say, she can give the papers to us? You can say, ella nos puede dar los papeles, or ella puede darnos los papeles. How would you say, I teach the concept to them? Yo les enseño los conceptos. How would you say, you write a letter to her? You can say, tú le escribes una carta a ella, or a ella, tú le escribes una carta. Using the present progressive now, and remembering that you have to put accents on infinitives, how would you say, I am reading the book for them? Yo les estoy leyendo el libro, or yo estoy leyéndoles el libro, with an accent on the infinitive. How would you say, we are telling the truth to you? You can say, nosotros te estamos diciendo la verdad, or nosotros estamos diciéndote la verdad, with an accent on the infinitive. And the last one, which can be said in multiple ways, how would you say, she is giving the money to him? Here are all the constructions for this phrase. A él, ella le está dando el dinero. A él, ella está dándole el dinero, with an accent on the infinitive. Ella le está dando el dinero a él. Or, ella está dándole el dinero a él, with an accent on the infinitive. Even though it's a long example, this is how indirect object pronouns work in Spanish. And it doesn't matter which phrase you say, because all of them express the same meaning. And in case you get confused, you can always go back to the basics and say any phrase you want, because people will still understand you. My goal is to not confuse you, but to show you that there are multiple answers to any question and that there are multiple ways to answer any question. It doesn't always have to be one answer and one answer only. With the examples that I gave in the video, I tried my best at showing you all the possibilities that you can use with any sentence you want to say. And in case you got all of them right, then you did a really good job at finding other ways to find different answers. In my two previous videos, I explained the concept behind direct and indirect object pronouns and how they apply separately. Direct object pronouns is when a sentence has only one direct object that can be replaced with a pronoun not to repeat its form of a noun. Instead of saying, I buy a car, I can say I buy it, with it being a direct object pronoun. Indirect object pronouns is when a sentence has two objects, with the first being a direct object and the second being an indirect object. An indirect object pronoun is when an indirect object noun is put into pronoun form to not repeat itself. Instead of saying I buy a car for John, I can say I buy a car for him, with him being the indirect object pronoun. While I talked about both concepts separately, in this video, I will show how to combine both types of pronouns in one sentence. And this concept is actually easier than people think. In case you don't remember, Remember, here's what the Spanish pronouns look like. They both share the same syntax for me, you, us, and all of you, but change in the he and they pronouns. Lo, la, los, and las mean it or them as something masculine or feminine, while le and les mean he or she and them as a person. Combining both pronouns in one sentence is actually not that hard, but there are a few rules to note with both pronouns whenever you decide to use them. The first rule is that if you're using a direct object pronoun and an indirect object pronoun in one sentence, the indirect object pronoun has to come first in the sentence. And as always, both pronouns come before a conjugated verb in a sentence. Take a look at this phrase in English. I buy a car for you. Car is a direct object noun. You is an indirect object already in pronoun form. And so the phrase in Spanish would be, yo te compro un coche. This sentence, both in English and Spanish, can be said using both types of pronouns. And instead of saying, I buy a car for you, we can say, I buy you it. Saying this phrase in Spanish is actually not that hard because you have to remember to put both pronouns before a conjugated verb with the indirect object pronoun coming first. In Spanish, the phrase would simply be, yo te lo compro, with te being the indirect object pronoun you, and lo being a direct object pronoun, 
that's a masculine it. This sentence can also be rephrased using the present progressive, such as I am buying you it. And this is where the second rule comes in, allowing both pronouns in Spanish to be attached to infinitives. We can say yo te lo estoy comprando or yo estoy comprándotelo, with the indirect object pronoun coming first after the infinitive and with an accent on the infinitive. Yo estoy comprándotelo. However, considering that comprando is an infinitive that changes form, it has to have an accent regardless if you're using a direct or indirect object pronoun or both. Sometimes you can have infinitives that don't change, like in the phrase yo puedo comprarlo, I can buy it, which puts lo with comprar. And as you can see, no accent is needed here because you're using an infinitive that doesn't change and the emphasis on the syllable doesn't go away. However, the third rule is that when you use both types of pronouns, you must put an accent on both types of infinitives, such as saying I am buying you it or I can buy you it, which in Spanish would be yo estoy comprándotelo and yo puedo comprártelo. If you decide to attach both pronouns to infinitives, then you have to remember to put accents on them to keep their sound. If you decide to put the pronouns before a conjugated verb, then no accent is needed. Here are some examples. How would you say the phrase she gives me it in Spanish with it being masculine? Ella me lo da, with me being the indirect object and lo being a direct object. Now, how would you say she is giving me it? You can say, ella me lo está dando, or if you want to attach the pronouns to the infinitive, you can say, ella está dándomelo, with an accent on the infinitive. How would you say the phrase, you are showing us it, with it being feminine? You can say, tú nos la estás mostrando, or tú estás mostrándonosla, with an accent on the infinitive. How would you say the phrase, they want to present them to you, with them being masculine? You can say ellos te los quieren presentar or ellos quieren presentártelos with an accent on the infinitive. The more you try this concept, the faster you'll get it and hopefully I'm doing a good job presenting these explanations because now there's one last rule you need to know with both types of pronouns, also known as double object pronouns, and that is whenever you decide to use two specific types of them, you'll need to modify one of them to avoid repetition. Here's what I mean. Take a look at this sentence. She makes it for him, with it being masculine. How would you say this phrase in Spanish? Considering that you know the rules for indirect object pronouns, instinctively, you would probably say something like ella le lo hace a él. Or if you want to, you can put a él at the beginning of the sentence. By technicality, this sentence would be right if it wasn't for Spanish's rule for double object pronouns, and that is, if you're using two pronouns with the letter L, you have to change the indirect object pronoun to se to avoid repeating the same letter. Instead of saying ella le lo hace a él, you need to say ella se lo hace a él. And you need to keep the a él part in the sentence because we wouldn't know who the pronoun refers to without it. This concept can also be replicated using an infinitive such as she wants to make it for him which can be said as ella se lo quiere hacer a él or ella quiere hacérselo a él with an accent on the infinitive and with a él in the sentence. The trickiest thing to remember with this rule is that you cannot use two pronouns with the letter L and therefore this limits our observation when it comes down to both types of pronouns. If the rule says we cannot use two pronouns with the letter L, this means that the rule can only be applied whenever we use le, les, with lo, la, los, or las, being him, her, them, combined with it or them. The only combination we can have with two pronouns beginning with the letter L is whenever we use le or les with lo, la, los, or las. And only in these cases does le and les change into se. So overall, you have to change the indirect object pronoun to se to avoid repeating the same letter, which limitedly means that whenever you're using le or les plus lo, la, los, or las, le and les in inevitably both turn into se. So at the end, you wouldn't know who se refers to without using the construction a plus a pronoun. With indirect object pronouns, le can mean to him or to her. So we need to use the construction a él or a ella to be more specific. The pronoun les is actually already specific enough, so we don't need to use this construction. However, with double object pronouns, because le and les both begin with the letter l, both of them turn into the word se. And therefore, using the pronoun se with double object pronouns can simultaneously mean to him or to her or to them. So we need to specify it with a él, a ella, a ellos or a ellas. And that's really the difficult part to remember whenever you use two pronouns with the letter L. Hopefully this will make sense to you. Here are some examples of double object pronouns using two pronouns with the letter L. How would you say the phrase she writes it to him? You would say ella se lo escribe a él and you would in tu se los lees a ellos. With ellos being to them, and los being them as the object you read. Here are some final examples with infinitives. How would you say, I am buying it to them? You can say, yo se lo estoy comprando a ellos, or yo estoy comprándoselo a ellos, with an accent on the infinitive. If you wanted to, you could have put the a ellos part at the beginning of the sentence. How would you say the phrase, I can do it to him? 
You can say, yo se lo puedo hacer a él, or yo puedo hacérselo a él, with an accent on the infinitive. And notice how in both phrases, a él refers to him because it's an indirect object pronoun that only changes to se because we cannot have two pronouns with the letter L. I really hope that this video showed you some good examples and explained how to combine both types of pronouns together. And in case you're still confused, you can always go back and try to understand the concept your way. With more practice, double object pronouns would eventually become an easy topic for you. You've probably seen many people explain the verb gustar in Spanish by saying that this verb means to like, as in me gusta bailar and me gusta cantar, which means I like to dance and I like to sing. I, however, do not like these explanations because they tend to confuse people rather than make them understand the subject matter properly. In sentences like I like to dance and I like to sing, what I recommend doing is instead of using the construction me gusta, which visually doesn't make sense, you can use the verb amar, which means to love. Instead of thinking of how to use gustar in English and instead of saying I like to dance or to sing, you can simply say yo amo bailar and yo amo cantar, which would be I love to dance or to sing. And this method is actually quite effective because most of the time that's how we use these verbs and it also makes your brain think in terms of the order of the words in English. Unlike many people who explain gustar as to like, I want to give gustar a different definition, as in it pleases or they please. The verb gustar is actually a very strange verb in Spanish because it has a very unusual conjugation pattern that doesn't follow the normal pattern with normal AR verbs. Gustar has only two types of conjugations, which are gusta and gustan, and they mainly come from the English verb to please. In English, the syntax of to please stays the same for five pronouns and only changes in the he, she, it pronoun. To connect gustar more with English, concentrate on the bottom pronouns for a bit, specifically on the pronouns it pleases and they please. The reason why I've mentioned this is because this is how systematically gustar works in Spanish, and that's the closest connection I can give it in English. You might have heard some teachers say that gustar also refers to somebody being pleased by something, and this is actually a definition that's more accurate, and I'll get to that in a bit. Gustar is considered to be an irregular verb verb not only because it has two conjugations, but also because it doesn't use normal pronouns like yo, tu, el, nosotros, and so on, but rather it uses indirect object pronouns to specify who is being pleased by what, putting the pronouns before a conjugated verb. And therefore, the only sentences that you can have with gustar are me gusta, te gusta, le gusta, and we have to remember to use the construction a el or a ella to specify who le refers to. And basically, the list goes on. The reason why Spanish uses this construction with gustar is because it specifies who is being pleased by what by putting the indirect object pronoun before a conjugated verb. Looking at this phrase, me gusta, one might say expressively that it means I like. But visually looking at this phrase, it doesn't make sense for this phrase to be that, because me means me, and it's not a normal pronoun. In English, whenever we say I like, we use the normal pronoun I, and like is the syntax that applies to the noun, and not the continuation after it. With the verb gustar, the conjugation gusta applies to the thing being pleased, and not the pronoun. As in, it pleases me, me gusta, or they please me, me gusta. Overall, gustar doesn't necessarily mean to like something, but it means to be pleased by something, with gusta referring to it pleases and gustan referring to they please. And from there, we simply have to choose any indirect object pronoun that we want to use. In Spanish, it makes sense, but in English, it's a tricky topic to explain because English doesn't have a notion of this. I'm just using this comparison to visually show gustar as closely as I can in English. Nonetheless, whenever we say me gusta or me gustan, we're not necessarily saying I like, but rather we're saying it pleases me or they please me. And we know to use pleases with it and please with they because it's the syntax in English. Gusta refers to it pleases plus any pronoun you want and gustan refers to they please plus any pronoun you want. The phrase me gusta bailar doesn't necessarily mean I like to dance but rather it pleases me to dance which is a translation that's far more logical in English than I like to dance. If I say te gusta cantar I'm saying it pleases you to sing which doesn't automatically mean you like to sing. Gusta in both cases refers to the infinitive because the indirect object pronoun is being pleased by the infinitive and therefore gusta will always refer to it. Just like in English, pleases refers to it and please refers to they. We don't say in English it please or they pleases, we quite literally say the opposite and that's exactly how gustar works in Spanish. If we say a sentence like me gustan gatos, then we're using gustan because the continuation is a noun that's plural and if we put this phrase in English we would have they please me but because we have cats as the noun we would say cats please me and so the phrase doesn't really mean I like cats but rather cats please me. However, what if we have a sentence like me gusta bailar y cantar? In this case, some people might think to use gustan because the continuation is plural. But actually, this sentence can be broken down into two separate phrases like me gusta bailar and me gusta cantar, which shows that we don't need to use gustan because nothing is plural. It's the same thing as saying it pleases me to dance and to sing, which can be said as one phrase in English or be broken down separately, which still doesn't change the it pleases part. Overall, the same concept basically applies to any pronoun you want to say, 
along with any continuation that you want to use. And here are some examples. Saying me gusta hablar contigo would literally mean it pleases me to speak with you. But if we want to use gustan, we can say something like me gustan tus palabras. And in this case, we would use gustan because the sentence would be your words please me with the word please in the sentence. Saying a sentence like te gusta la casa would literally mean the house pleases you with the house being it which pleases you. Saying a sentence like a él le gusta jugar fútbol would literally mean it pleases him to play football with him being the construction a él because we have to remember that we don't know who le refers to without this construction. We can also say something like nos gusta hablar español which would be it pleases us to speak Spanish and we can also say le gusta escuchar a música which would be it pleases them to listen to music. You can say any sentence you want using the verb gustar but as I said at the beginning of the video instead of saying phrases like me gusta bailar we can say yo amo bailar which would mean I love to dance rather than I like to dance or it pleases me to dance. And the same idea applies to any pronoun you want to use. In this video I wanted to show you how the verb gustar works in Spanish so that you can understand how the verb works in English. Rather than explain gustar as to like I decided to give a different perspective on this verb to show how it's closely related to English. So this video was more of a logical presentation of how gustar looks like in English. Sometimes there are concepts that are more practical to know than to use. And I would say that gustar falls into this category. Spanish has many verbs, some of which are normal across all pronouns and some of which are not so normal called irregular yo verbs. While you may encounter regular verbs like comer, the syntax of comer across all pronouns follows the standard conjugation pattern of verbs ending in er such as o, s, e, and so on. However, sometimes in Spanish you'll encounter verbs that follow this pattern across all pronouns except in the yo pronoun. And while these verbs follow the normal syntax of every other pronoun, they do not follow the pattern for the yo pronoun because Spanish says that these conjugations don't sound good enough when the word is said. There are useful verbs like salir which means to leave and while the verb follows the normal syntax of verbs ending in ir, it doesn't do so with the yo pronoun. You would want to say yo salo but Spanish says that this word sounds bad so instead you would say yo salgo ending the pronoun with go which is actually a common ending for irregular verbs in the yo pronoun some of which I covered in my previous videos like hacer and tener. Hacer follows the normal pattern across all pronouns but changes to ago in the yo pronoun so that it sounds better when said. Tener does the same thing with yo tengo but it's also a stem changing verb across some pronouns but the topic of stem changing verbs is for the video after this one. You might also encounter irregular verbs in the yo pronoun like conducir and traducir. In both cases the verbs follow the normal pattern of conjugating verbs ending in ir but for the yo pronoun you would want to say yo conduco or yo traduco but Spanish says that these words sound bad when said so it adds an extra letter to avoid the bad sound and so the conjugations would end in sco pronounce yo conduzco and yo traduzco which would mean I drive and I translate. You might also encounter this verb dar which means to give and while it follows the normal pattern of conjugating verbs ending in ar the conjugation for the yo pronoun is not yo do but yo doy which is sort of similar to yo soy with the verb ser and yo estoy with the verb estar. At last there's also the verb ver which means to see and while its conjugations perfectly correspond to all pronouns the yo pronoun is not yo vo but rather yo veo which means I see. When using verbs like salir, hacer, tener, conducir, traducir, dar and ver you have to remember that these verbs follow the normal syntax across all of their pronouns except in the yo pronoun which therefore makes the verbs irregular yo verbs. And actually these verbs would be practical to use whenever you decide to speak Spanish but just remember to utilize the yo pronoun properly with them. There are more types of irregular yo verbs like poner, suponer, proteger and traer and while these verbs follow different patterns for the yo pronoun I recommend knowing these verbs rather than using them because generally speaking they're not that useful in conversation. For instance poner and suponer follow the common go ending in the yo pronoun while maintaining the normal syntax across the rest of the pronouns. Proteger is an interesting verb because it's actually the only verb in Spanish that follows an irregular ho ending for the yo pronoun while still maintaining the normal conjugation pattern. At last you can have a verb like traer which follows the normal pattern of verbs ending in er but in the yo pronoun it has the ending traigo and actually this ending is done on purpose not to confuse it with trago which in Spanish comes from the word tragar which means to swallow, suck down or eat crap. And actually it's one of the most offensive verbs that there is so it's best to not mention it. Overall you just have to know that with verbs like these you have to slightly modify the yo pronoun across all verbs so that the word sounds uniform when said and at that point you can basically say any sentence you want using these verbs. Stem changing verbs in Spanish are verbs that change their beginning prefix or stem to generate a better sound when the words are said. In Spanish there are four types of stem changing verbs and in the video I will not explain all stem changing verbs that exist in Spanish but rather present a useful verb in each category so that you can understand how stem changing works in Spanish and then apply it to any other verb that you want in that category. The four main types of stem changing verbs in Spanish are e to ie, e to e, 
O to U E and U to U E. Considering E to E E as the first category of stem changing verbs in Spanish, I actually already covered a verb like that in one of my previous videos, and that is the verb tener. However, for the sake of learning, let's use a different useful verb like empezar, which means to start or to begin. At first, the stem changing rule will only apply in the yo, tu, el, and ellos pronouns, and will not apply in the nosotros and vosotros pronouns. You would want to say something like yo empezo, but Spanish says that this word sounds bad when said, so instead, you have to slightly modify the stem of the verb from empezo to yo empiezo, which means I start. And the stem changing concept applies to the rest of the pronouns aside from nosotros and vosotros. Tu empiezas, you start, el empieza, he starts, nosotros empezamos, we start, vosotros empezáis, y'all start, and ellos empiezan they start. As always, try not focusing on these pronouns because they're not that useful in conversation. And like I said at the beginning of the video, it's important to know how stem changing verbs work in Spanish, but it's not important to know every single stem changing verb like empezar, which changes from e to ie. If you see a modified verb that goes from e to ie, chances are that it's stem changing. Next up, there are verbs that change their stem from e to e, like decir, which is a useful verb meaning to say. Decir is actually considered to be irregular in the yo pronoun with the construction yo digo, but as far as the rest of the pronouns go, they Decir still applies its stem changing rule for tu, el, and ellos. You would want to say tu deses, but Spanish says that this verb sounds bad when said, so instead, you have to say tu dices, which means you say. El dice, he says, nosotros decimos, we say, vosotros decís, y'all say, and ellos dicen, they say. Try not focusing on these pronouns because they're not that useful in conversation, but in case you see any other verb that changes from e to e, chances are it's stem changing. Next up, there are verbs that change from o to ue, and I actually covered a useful verb like that in one of my previous videos, which is poder, but for the sake of learning, let's use a different useful verb like recordar, which means to remember. Instead of saying yo recordo, you need to say yo recuerdo, which sounds better when said, and the same concept applies to the rest of the pronouns. Tu recuerdas, you remember, el recuerda, he remembers, nosotros recordamos, we remember, vosotros recordáis, y'all remember, and ellos recuerdan, they remember. Try not focusing on these pronouns because they're not that useful in conversation, but if you see a verb with ue in it, chances are it's stem changing. And finally, there's one last type of a stem changing verb in Spanish, and as far as I know, it's the only verb in Spanish that changes from u to ue, and that is the verb jugar, which means to play. Instead of saying yo jugo, you need to say yo juego. And one thing to note about both of these words is that the word jugo on its own actually means juice. And so it makes sense why it needs to be modified so that it's not confused with this word. However, the word juego on its own can also mean game, as in video juego, which means video game. But the word juego itself changes its meaning in context. And with the verb jugar, the stem changing rule will only apply for the yo, tu, el, and ellos pronouns. Tu juegas, you play, el juega, he plays, nosotros jugamos, we play, vosotros jugáis, y'all play, and ellos juegan they play. Try not focusing on these pronouns, because like I say all the time, they're not useful in conversation. What you should have known from this video is how to systematically modify stem changing verbs in Spanish so that you can understand how words sound better when they're said out loud. Of course, learning all stem changing verbs in Spanish is completely redundant, but it's very useful to understand how every type of stem changing verb works in Spanish. The verb saber in Spanish means to know, but it's not used the same way as it's used in English. In English, we use the verb to know in many different ways, including knowing factual information, how to do something, and knowing people, places, and things in general. Spanish, however, encompasses only some of the things I've listed, and so the language creates two verbs for the verb to know, and in this video, I will only cover the verb saber. Rather than explain the verb how most teachers explain it, I would like to give it a different definition by saying that the verb means to know how to do something or knowing factual information, and it actually has the same concept as the verb said, which means to be. The syntax of saber follows the normal conjugation pattern for verbs ending in er, but is actually irregular in the yo pronoun. Yo sé means I know, and make sure to put an accent on sé, because without the accent, you will have an indirect object pronoun that will have multiple definitions that have to do with oneself. Tu sabes means you know how to do something, which is factual. El sabe, he knows how to do something. Nosotros sabemos, we know. Vosotros sabéis, y'all know. And ellos saben, they know. Try not concentrating on these pronouns because they're not that useful in conversation, but like I said at the beginning, the verb saber refers to factually knowing something, part of which includes actions which are factually known. The best way that I can explain saber without any confusion is through the verb ser. Ser means to be, as in having factual traits about oneself, and so the same idea works for the verb saber because it refers to factually knowing information. For instance, if I say a sentence like, yo sé cómo hablar español, I'm fish, because it's a language that I've mastered over time, and now I know how to speak it. Just like with the verb ser, 
said, you cannot change any factual traits about oneself the same way you cannot forget the factual information you know or know how to do. If I say a sentence like, tu sabes el tiempo, I'm saying that you factually know the time because time is something factual to know and you cannot change that fact. If I say a sentence like, el sabe como nadar, I'm saying that he factually knows how to swim, meaning that he cannot change that fact about swimming. He knows how to swim and will not forget anything. And with examples that involve factually knowing how to do something, like, yo sé como hablar inglés, tu sabes como tocar el piano, and el sabe como cocinar bien, Spanish actually has a convenient way of putting phrases together so that they don't repeat unnecessary words by eliminating the word como from the sentence. Visually looking at the phrases in English and putting them in Spanish, I know how to speak Spanish, you know how to play the piano, and he knows how to cook well, you don't need to add the adverb como within the sentences. The reason why Spanish does that is to eliminate repetition of words because when you think about it, saying a phrase like I know to speak Spanish sounds sort of understandable on its own without the need of the word that specifies the action. So just simply remember that you won't need the adverb como in Spanish because the act of knowing how to do something is already clear enough in Spanish. Overall, the verb saber applies to knowing factual information and factually knowing how to do something. And it's actually a very essential verb in Spanish, allowing you to understand how to navigate your way around forms of speech. Once you have understood how to work with this verb, understanding the verb after saber will be a lot easier because normally educators will teach both verbs at once, which generally causes confusion between students. And so the verb conocer is for the video after this one. The verb conocer in Spanish means to be familiar with or be acquainted with people, places, and things in general. Unlike the verb saber, which means to know something factually or do something, the verb conocer tends to lean more towards acquaintances of ideas rather than knowing ideas. And if you think about it, there's a big difference between knowing something from top to bottom and knowing something that isn't fully clear, which is the reason why Spanish creates two verbs for to know, because one verb means to know something factually and completely, whereas the other indicates being acquainted with something rather than fully knowing what it is. The syntax of conocer follows the normal conjugation pattern of verbs ending in er, aside from the yo pronoun, which is irregular, following the tsko ending. Like I said at the beginning, conocer means more being familiar with people, places, and things in general, rather than knowing something factually. Therefore, yo conozco means I'm familiar with a person, place, or thing, rather than me knowing something factually, because being familiar with a person, place, or thing doesn't necessarily mean that I know it from top to bottom. Tu conoces means you're familiar with, el conoce means he's familiar with, nosotros conocemos, we're familiar with, vosotros conocéis, y'all are familiar with, and ellos conocen, they're familiar with. As always, try not focusing on these pronouns because they're not that useful in conversation. Overall, the verb conocer is actually considered to be a very useful verb in Spanish because it helps to differentiate the qualities of knowing something factually and being familiar with a person, place, or thing, which is sort of the same way the verbs ser and estar work. Conocer, as a matter of fact, is very useful when it comes down to asking questions and it actually uses direct object pronouns to replace people, places, and things, which could all be nouns. For instance, if I ask you, ¿Conoces la ciudad de Las Vegas? I'm not necessarily asking you if you know the city of Las Vegas, but rather if you're familiar with the city of Las Vegas, and you can reply with something like, si, sí, yo conozco la ciudad, or if you want to use a direct object pronoun, you can simply say, si, sí, yo la conozco. The reason why the verb saber cannot be used here is because by saying, sabes la ciudad de Las Vegas, the verb saber would have to imply that you know the city of Las Vegas from top to bottom, including the people, streets, food, and everything in general, which would be impossible to know, ultimately resulting in an incorrect use of saber, which is why Spanish calls the term conocer, being familiar with, rather than fully knowing the person, place, or thing. There are more examples that you can make with conocer, like asking about people, conoces a John? Meaning, are you familiar with John? And as you can see, Spanish decides to use the personal preposition a when it comes down to being familiar with people. But in this case, you can just consider the preposition to be the equivalence of the preposition with in English. So whenever you refer to people in general, you always have to include the personal a. And with the sentence, conoces a John? You can reply with, si, sí, yo conozco a John, or if you want to use a direct object pronoun, you can say, si, sí, yo lo conozco. There are of course more examples that you can make with conocer, like, el conoce a mi abuelo, he is familiar with my granddad, or maybe, yo conozco los libros, I'm familiar with the books, or maybe if you want to include an infinitive inside, you can say, tu quieres conocer el país, which would mean you want to be familiar with the country, as country refers to a physical place. Overall, conocer is an eminent verb in Spanish because it helps you understand how to think of people, places, and things in general by being familiar with these ideas rather than fully and factually knowing everything about people, places, and things. I actually don't understand why teachers teach both of these verbs at once, as I see the two verbs having completely different definitions, and so mainly, each verb needs its own explanation of how to work with it. The past tense for regular verbs in Spanish follows the same idea for the present tense, which I covered in one of my previous videos, but in this video, I will only explain the past tense for regular AR, ER, and IR verbs in Spanish, also known as the preterite or past simple tense. Just like with the present tense in Spanish, the past tense follows the same
same idea of dropping off the ending of the AR, ER, or IR verb and then adding the ending that corresponds with the pronoun. Let's start with regular AR verbs. For the yo pronoun, you drop the ending of the verb and then add the ending E with an accent, meaning that you'd always have an emphasis on that vowel when you say the conjugated verb. For tu, you drop the ending and then add the ending Aste. For el or eo said, you drop the ending and add the ending o with an accent, meaning that you likewise put an emphasis on that vowel. For nosotros, you put amos, and it's actually the same ending for the pronoun that you have in the present tense, and so you can only tell the difference between them in context. For vosotros, you put asteis, and for eos, you put aron. Let's use the verb hablar as an example. How would you conjugate hablar for the yo pronoun? You take hablar, drop the ending, and add the ending e with an accent, and so it's pronounced yo hablé, I spoke. It's not yo hablé, it's yo hablé. For tu, you drop the ending and add the ending aste, so you get hablaste, meaning you spoke. For el, or eo said, you get hablo with an emphasis on the last vowel. It's not hablo, it's hablo, he or she spoke. For nosotros, you get hablamos, and it's pronounced the same way as in the present form, and so you can only tell the difference between them in context. For vosotros, you get hablasteis, which is you all spoke, and for ellos, you get hablaron, they spoke. As far as AR verbs go, I recommend that you memorize all of these endings, except vosotros, because there is no pattern to follow with any of them, but the trickiest pronoun to use is nosotros, because the word hablamos can mean both we speak and we spoke. However, there is a way to tell the difference between them in context, and that is by looking for keywords that express time. For instance, if I say hablamos contigo ahora, I'm saying that we speak with you now, because the word ahora indicates that. However, if I have a sentence like hablamos con ellos ayer, the sentence would logically be we spoke with them yesterday because ayer indicates yesterday, which is an action done in the past and that's really as difficult as it gets. Now, there are verbs ending in ER and IR and conveniently, unlike the present tense which has a different conjugation pattern for each type of verb, Spanish decides to use the same syntax for the past tense of verbs ending in ER and IR. Both verbs that end in ER and IR share the same ending which might develop an easier conjugation pattern to memorize. For the yo pronoun, you drop the ending of the verb ending in er or ir and you add the ending e with an emphasis on that vowel. For tu, you drop the ending and add the ending iste. For el or eo usted, you drop the ending and add the ending io with an emphasis on the o. For nosotros, you drop the ending and add the ending imos, which is actually the same ending as the ending of verbs ending in ir in the present tense. And once again, you can only tell the difference between them in context. And finally, for vosotros, you get isteis, and for ellos, you get ieron. Let's use the verbs comer and vivir as useful verbs. How would you conjugate the verb comer in the past tense for the yo pronoun? You take comer, drop the ending, and put i, and so you get yo comí. I ate. For tu, you get comiste, which is you ate. For el, you get comió, which is he ate. For vosotros, you get comimos, which is we ate. Vosotros comisteis, y'all ate. And ellos comieron, they ate. And now, you simply replicate the same idea with regular verbs ending in IR, like vivir. However, don't forget about the nosotros pronoun of IR verbs ending in imos, because they do share the same ending. If I say vivimos en Las Vegas ahora, I'm saying that we live in Las Vegas now, because ahora indicates that. However, if I say vivimos en Los Angeles hace un año, I'm saying that we lived in Los Angeles a year ago, because hace un año is the construction that indicates that. So overall, you have to watch out for these things, because that's as difficult as it gets. And with regular verbs ending in ER and IR, I recommend just memorizing the pattern for all pronouns except vosotros because it's the same in both types of verbs and also because it's a pattern that you would see all the time whenever you study the past tense in Spanish. As I said in my video on how to conjugate verbs in Spanish in the present tense, there is no point in knowing every AR, ER, and IR verb out there because you'll never use all of them. I decided to utilize useful verbs like hablar, comer, and vivir to demonstrate how regular verbs in Spanish work in the past tense. I could have extended the video by giving examples, but I chose not to because I believe that you can do so on your own because knowing how the past or preterite tense works in Spanish is sufficient enough to understand how it can be used. As far as the past tense goes in Spanish, there are actually multiple variations of it like the imperfect, past perfect, conditional, and conditional perfect, and all of these tenses are topics for future videos, so I decided to not overcomplicate the past tenses in Spanish by simply showing the regular past simple tense for regular AR, ER, and IR verbs.
verbs. And if you see any verb that's conjugated in the ways that I've shown in the video, that means that this verb is in the past simple tense. Spanish has the verbs ser and ir, which mean to be and to go. And even though these verbs have different definitions, the convenient thing about them is that they both share the same syntax when they're put into past simple or preterite tense in Spanish. The verb ser means to be, as in being and having traits about oneself, and the syntax of this verb in the present tense has six different conjugations for the six pronouns. The verb ir, however, means to go and sometimes can be referred to as to go to, but its syntax is completely different in the present tense from the verb ser. The two verbs in the past simple tense share the same syntax, which makes Spanish more convenient, having an irregular conjugation pattern, and so you can only tell the difference between them in context. Fui can simultaneously mean I went somewhere or to do something, or I was, as in actions that were completed in the past, and I'll get to that in a bit. Fuiste can mean you went somewhere or to do something, and also you were in a position somewhere. Fue can mean he or she went, and it also has a ubiquitous use of it was in Spanish, making it one of the most useful words in the past simple tense. Fuimos means we went or we were, fuisteis means y'all went or y'all were, and fueron can mean they went or they were. I recommend that you actually focus on all pronouns except vosotros and ellos because all of these conjugations are very useful in Spanish. As I said before, you can only tell the difference between said and ear in the past simple in context, and there's actually an easy way to distinguish their meaning, and that is through the preposition a, which is used as the preposition to in English. Just like when we say actions in the present, such as yo voy a la tienda, I go to the store, it's the same way you would say the phrase in the past. Yo fui a la tienda. I went to the store, which ultimately changes only one word, making the language easier to understand and easier to distinguish from the verb ser. In this context, we know that the verb is ir because we see the preposition a, which is placed only after conjugations of the verb ir, regardless if it's in the present or past. Yo voy a la tienda and yo fui a la tienda mean I go to the store and I went to the store, which simply changes only one word, noticeably understanding that ir is used because you have the preposition a after the conjugation in both cases. However, you can sometimes Sometimes refer to actions like tu vas a hacer tu tarea, you go to do your homework, and if you want to put the phrase in the past, you simply change only one word by saying tu fuiste a hacer tu tarea, you went to do your homework. And in both cases, everything else in the sentence stays the same, besides the conjugation of ir, both in English and Spanish, and you can make more examples like ella fue al concerto ayer, she went to the concert yesterday, with ayer indicating that the action happened in the past, and also having al, which means to the, again knowing that it's the verb ir. You you can also say a sentence like, fuimos a ver la fiesta, we went to see the party, and this sentence also has the preposition a inside, which refers to an action done in the past, once again, showing that the sentence contains the verb ir. The biggest tip that I can give for telling the difference between said and ir in the past simple is that if you see this conjugation and you don't know which one it is, try looking for the preposition a after the conjugation. If there is an a with or without an infinitive, the verb is ir because there isn't much of a change from its form in the present. Now, understanding how the verb said works in the past simple is actually a bit more difficult to comprehend due to its variations in the past. Currently, we're working in the past simple, also known as the preterite. And as I said in my previous video, Spanish has many variations of the past, such as the imperfect, conditional, and so on. However, what's important with the verb ser is that it's used in the past simple strictly for describing actions that specifically happened in the past. And I'm putting a very big emphasis on the word specifically, as I don't want to lie to any of you watching this video, I myself struggle with the verb ser in the past simple, but I can describe it in the easiest way possible. You might remember me explaining the verb said in one of my previous videos, where I described how the verb said works in the present form, part of which includes the following applications of said. You might be thinking that since these are the uses that are utilized for said in the present form, then they all have to be used in the past tense also. However, since I said that said is used in the past only for situations that were finished specifically and factually, this narrows the field of the verb being used in the past only to when, where, and how events took place, which can also be explained as events that happened or finished in the past. Suppose we have the phrase la película fue aburrida, meaning the movie was boring. In this case, we have the use of fue, which indicates was, as in the movie was boring. Since a movie is an event that happened in the past and stayed in the past, the act of the sentence remains factual because of how was the movie. And since there is the word fue in the sentence, this shows you how fue is used more than the other conjugations of said. However, and this is something that I'll show rather than explain, if you take this phrase the movie was boring and plug it into a translator, it 
might give a translation that has the word era. While the translation of the sentence doesn't go away, the meaning is quite wrong about the phrase because era is the imperfect tense of ser of the it pronoun, meaning used to be. And it's actually a word that's used more often than fue, but the emphasis of this video is the past simple. Saying la película era aburrida means the movie used to be boring, which logically doesn't make sense, which is why fue has to be used, indicating how events took place in the past. Era is used more when it comes down to describing objects and people, but it's a topic for a future video. In this video, I just wanted to mention that so that you don't get confused about how to use ser in the past tense. Fue is by far the most common use of ser, used for the construction it was. La difícil hacer la prueba. It was difficult to study for the test, which can be said the same in the present tense by simply changing one word. Es difícil hacer la prueba. It is difficult to do the test. And you can also have simpler sentences, which are sentences that I recommend using the most, like la fuesta fue en el club, meaning the party was in the club, which is the easiest sentence that shows how ser is used perfectly and logically in the past by acting as an event that took place in the past and stayed in the past. In the video, I wanted to show how the verbs ser and ir work in Spanish by having the same syntax in the past simple tense and also being able to tell the difference between them in context. Of course, you can make any sentence that you want using ser and ir, but the biggest tip that I can give in order to tell the difference between them in context is that the verb ir means to go and if you see the preposition a with or without an infinitive after it, then the verb has to be ir. Alongside, the verb ser means to be and if you see a sentence that begins with the construction fue, meaning it was, or a sentence that has fue in it with an event that specifically finished in the past, then that verb is the verb ser in the past. If you want to, you can even practice on some of my sentences in the video and put them in English in order to see if you got them right. And if you did, then you did a good job. There are many types of verbs in Spanish, such as stem changing, irregular yo, and just irregular verbs in general. And in this video, I would like to describe every type of them in the past simple form. Even though not every verb will be included in the video, because you don't need all of them, I will explain all types of verbs in the past for the first video, but in the second one, I'll finish what I left off. The list will include weird stem changing verbs and irregular yo verbs, which I will separate by categories and explain how to use in the past, doing so as quickly as I can, starting with generic irregular verbs that have the TUV change in them. One of the verbs that falls into this category is tener, which doesn't follow the normal conjugation pattern of verbs ending in ER. Instead of following the syntax of normal verbs ending in ER, tener decides to use TUV as its main stem. Yo tuve means I had, tu tuviste, you had, el tuvo, he had, and so on. I recommend not focusing on these pronouns because they're not that useful in conversation, and so the other ones are more useful, like saying, yo tuve un gato, I had a cat, or maybe if you want to include an action inside, you can say, tu tuviste que hacer tu tarea, meaning you had to do your homework. And from there, you can make any sentence you want. After the verb tener, there are some verbs that have the word tener in them with different prefix in the beginning, such as detener, retener, contener, and obtener. And in case you want to use any of them in the past tense, you have to remember to likewise change them with the te uv like you changed tener. And with verbs like these, it's more useful to know them than to use them. Luckily for Spanish, there's a very useful verb that similarly uses the te uv ending, which is something you don't expect from this verb, and that is the verb estar. Rather than following normal conjugation patterns for verbs ending in ar, estar decides to use the te uv ending in all of its pronouns. Yo estuve means I was, tu estuviste, you were, el estuvo, he was, and so on. Like with the verb tener, I recommend not focusing on these pronouns because the other ones are more useful. One important rule you have to remember with estar in the past is that it's used for things done in the past that stayed in the past. In my video about estar, I talked about the applications of estar in the present, but in the past, it basically applies for a location more than to anything else. I can say a sentence like, estoy en Madrid con él, I am in Madrid with him, but if I want to say this phrase in the past, I'd simply say, yo estuve en Madrid con él, because my action was finished in the past, meaning that I never returned there. And of course, you can make any sentence you want, but just be careful with using locations in the past. The last verb that follows the uv ending is another verb you don't expect, and that is the verb andar, meaning to walk. Instead of following the normal conjugation of ar verbs, it decides to use the uv ending to indicate an action done in the past. With a verb like andar, I recommend just knowing the verb rather than using it. Next up, there are verbs that follow a pus ending, which luckily share the same verb, but with different prefixes, and that is the verb poner. Instead of following the normal conjugation, pattern of verbs ending in ER, Spanish decides to change it to PUS for all pronouns. Yo puse means I put in the past, tu pusiste, you put, el puso, he put, 
and so on. As always, don't concentrate on these pronouns because they're not that useful in conversation. If you were to say a sentence in the past using poner, you can say something like yo puse mi teléfono aquí, I put my phone here. Or maybe you can ask a question like donde pusiste mi camisa, meaning where did you put my shirt? Of course, you can say any sentence you want using this verb, I'm just giving a few examples to demonstrate how to use the verb. After poner, there are many other verbs that follow the PUS change like suponer, proponer, disponer, componer, and descomponer. And in case you have to use any of them in the past, remember to change them the same way you would change poner. And with verbs like these, I recommend just knowing them rather than using them. Next up, there are verbs ending in de u jota, and as far as I know, there are only three of them in Spanish, and they're very useful, like conducir, traducir, and producir. Rather than following the pattern of verbs ending in ir, Spanish decides to change them in the ending by adding de u jota. Taking the verb conducir as an example, yo conduje means I drove, tu condujiste means you drove, el condujo means he drove, and so on. I recommend knowing all pronouns except vosotros because the sentences that you can make with them are very useful. And the same concept applies to all of them whenever you decide to use them in the past any way you want. While we're on the category of de u jota, there are verbs that have an i jota ending in the past simple, meaning to say or to tell. Instead of following the pattern of ir verbs, Spanish gives the verb decir an i jota change. Yo dije, I spoke, tu dijiste, you spoke, and so on. With a verb like decir, I recommend knowing all pronouns except vosotros because these pronouns are very useful, especially when you incorporate every Spanish concept with them. For instance, I can say a sentence like, yo te dije que voy a estar ahí, meaning I told you that I'm going to be there. Or maybe some simpler sentences would be better, like, él me dijo eso ayer, he told me that yesterday. Or maybe, ellos nos dijeron que están ahí, they told us that they are there. With a verb like decir, you can basically make any sentence you want, depending on what you want to say. Actually, there are some verbs that put a prefix before decir, like predecir and contradecir, and whenever you want to use these verbs in the past, remember to change them like decir. And as always, it's more useful to know them than to use them. At last, there's the verb traer, meaning to bring, which is actually the last verb to include a jota in the past simple tense. Instead of following normal ER verb conjugations, traer decides to add a jota in every pronoun. Yo traje, I brought, tu trajiste, you brought, and so on. With a verb like traer, I recommend knowing it rather than using it. Next up, there's the east category, which is used through the verb hacer. Instead of following the normal ER our pattern, hacer uses an irregular pattern across all pronouns, and not only does it do that, but it has an irregular word within its irregular pattern for the el, ella pronoun, which is hizo, meaning he or she did or made. The reason Spanish does that is because when se is put before an o, it would have a que sound like el ico, but the word needs to maintain a se sound, so it uses zeta instead. With hacer, I recommend knowing all pronouns except vosotros because they're useful in conversation. For instance, a common question that is asked many times is que hiciste ayer, meaning what did you do yesterday? And you can reply with yo hice mi tarea, meaning I did my homework. You can also use the verb as to make in a sentence like nosotros hicimos la cama, we made the bed, or maybe ellos hicieron un pastel para nosotros, they made a cake for us. And of course, you can make any sentence you want using hacer. There are also the verbs deshacer and rehacer, and in case you want to use any of them in the past, you have to change them as you would with hacer. But with these verbs, it's more useful to know them than to use them. The last category for this video is verbs that have the vin ending, like venir. Rather than following the normal pattern of verbs ending in ir, venir changes all of its conjugations in the past. Yo vine, I came, tu viniste, you came, and so on. I suggest knowing all pronouns, except vosotros, because it's a useful verb to know in the past. For instance, a common question with venir in the past is de donde viniste, meaning from where you came. And you can reply with yo vine de mi casa, I came from my house. You can also say something like vinimos del concierto por la noche, we came from the concert at night, or maybe, ellos vinieron de la escuela, they came from the school. And of course, you can make any sentence you want using the verb venir in the past. And actually, there is the verb prevenir, meaning to prevent, and in case you want to use it in the past, remember to change it like the verb venir, and as always, it's a verb that's more useful to know than to utilize. This has been all types of irregular verbs in the past tense in Spanish, part one. The last category of irregular verbs in the past tense in Spanish is the category I call miscellaneous, meaning that there are verbs that irregularly change their form in the past and that there aren't any other verbs that replicate their form, like the verb caber, meaning to fit. Rather than following the pattern of verbs ending in er, as far as I know, caber is the only verb that follows the se upe pattern. Yo cupe, I fit, tu cupiste, you fit, and so on. I recommend knowing this verb rather than using it. Next up, there is the verb poder, which is the only verb that has the pe 
pude pattern in the past. Yo pude, I could, tu pudiste, you could, and so on. I recommend knowing all pronouns except vosotros because poder is a very useful verb in the past tense, but one important rule to remember with poder in the past simple is that it's only used for actions that happened in the past and that stayed in the past. It's significant to not confuse it with a phrase like I could have plus an infinitive because this would be the past participle in Spanish, which is a topic for a future video. Instead, you can use poder in the past simple by saying something like yo pude hablar con él, I could speak with him, or maybe tu pudiste ir a la fiesta, you could go to the party. Of course, it's up to you to say any sentence that you want with poder. After poder, there's the verb saber, which is the only verb that uses an SUP pattern. Yo supe means I knew, tu supiste means you knew, and so on. Don't focus on these pronouns because they're not that useful in conversation. One thing to note with saber in the past simple is that it's used in context when it comes down to knowing something factually, but not necessarily something that you knew how to do. In the present, saber is used for the following applications, but in the past simple tense, it's used to know something factual, like saying, yo supe quien ganó el juego. I knew who won the game. And in the sentence, I used saber in the past by factually knowing who won the game, along with using a regular AR verb for the he, she pronoun. Of course, it's up to you to say any sentence that you want with saber. After saber, there's the verb querer, which is the only verb that uses a quise pattern. Yo quise is I wanted, tu quisiste is you wanted, and so on. Don't focus on these pronouns because they're not that useful in conversation. One thing to note with querer is that it's used in the past simple for things that you wanted in the past and that stayed in the past, like saying yo quise jugar contigo, I wanted to play with you, which is an action that I wanted to do and I no longer want to do it. I can also say something like ella quiso abrir la puerta, she wanted to open the door, because it's an action that stayed in the past, meaning that she no longer wants to do it. At last, in the miscellaneous category, there are the verbs ver and dar, and the easiest way to remember them in the past simple tense is that they literally share the same ending for all pronouns, aside from the first letter of every conjugation. Yo vi, I saw, yo di, I gave. Tu viste, you saw, tu diste, you gave, and so on. I recommend focusing on all pronouns, except vosotros, because they're useful in conversation. Try some examples on your own. Yo te vi en la fiesta means I saw you at the party. Tu viste mi madre en la casa means you saw my mother in the house. El vio como yo hice mi tarea means he saw how I did my homework. Yo te di mi lápiz means I gave you my pencil. El nos dio el pase means he gave us the pass. These are just some of the examples that you can make with ver and dar in the past simple, and as always, you can say any sentence you want using ver and dar. Now, we get to the category of stem changing verbs in the past simple. The very first thing that I suggest to all of you is to remember that basically all of these stem changing verbs will only apply their stem changing rule for the el and eos pronouns. All of these verbs are regular verbs that follow normal conjugation patterns across their pronouns except for el and eos. So just remember that. The second thing I'll say is that I won't give any examples with any of the following verbs because these are stem changing verbs that you should know more than use, considering that the only useful way to utilize them is through the el and eos pronouns. Taking a verb like sugerir, for instance, it's a stem changing verb that falls into the e to e category, and it follows the normal conjugation pattern of verbs ending in ir except for el and eos. Instead of using the stem beginning with e, sugerir decides to use e instead, and at the most, it's a verb that's more useful to know than to utilize. Generally, the same concept applies to the rest of the verbs that I'm about to list, going from e to e, like mentir, which means to lie, preferir, which means to prefer, seguir, meaning to follow, conseguir, meaning to get, repetir, meaning to repeat, servir, meaning to serve, and pedir, meaning to ask for. All of these verbs are useful to know rather than to use, and the only thing you should know about them is that they change their stems from e to e only in the el and eos pronouns in the past simple tense. Next up, there are stem changing verbs going from o to u, and as far as I know, there are only two of them in Spanish, and these are dormir and morir, meaning to sleep and to die. Dormir follows the normal pattern of IR verbs, but only changes its stem in the el and eos pronouns, meaning el durmió, he slept, and eos durmieron, they slept. And the same concept applies to the verb morir. El murió is he died, and eos murieron is they died. As always, these verbs are more useful to know than to use. The last category of stem changing verbs are verbs that have the letter Y and also include accents in most of their pronouns in order to maintain 
the sound after having two vowels right next to each other. These can be verbs like creer, leer, and oír. And as you can see, they are the only verbs in Spanish that have two vowels right next to each other, so Spanish decides to put accents on some of their pronouns in the past simple in order to maintain their sound. The easiest way to memorize them is to remember that they all share the same ending but different letters in the beginning. Yo creí is I believed, yo leí is I read, and yo oí is I heard. Tu creíste is you believed, tu leíste is you read, and tu oíste is you heard, and so on. As always, it's useful to know these verbs rather than to use them. And now, we made it to the final category of irregular verbs in Spanish, which I think is the easiest, and that is irregular verbs that are only irregular in the yo pronoun in the past symbol. Actually, there are three types of them in Spanish, known as verbs that end in car, gar, or tsar. And since there's no point in knowing all verbs in Spanish, I'll show one useful 